right, I'm going live for my first time on YouTube. Um, one more second here, Chad. I'm going live. My name is Dylan Panko. Welcome to my channel. Uh, I'm an avid outdoorsman. Spent a I spent a lot of time outdoors as much as I possibly can. Uh, as far as background goes, the automotive. Uh, I've got 20 years. Uh, experience in the construction industry, but I'm trying to branch out of that and get into drones. Uh, with drones, I'm actually going to be using them for construction uh, inspections. Uh, the first place I'm gonna go is photovoltaic or solar panel inspections. Uh, in the meantime, uh, I love going outdoors. Both my cars are four wheel drive and I take full advantage of four wheel drive. I love to go out in the Mendocino National Forest spontaneously. Uh, just go somewhere or look at the map and try and see if I can get to that location with the vehicles I have because the vehicles I have are all stock. Um, in the uh, meantime, uh, I make videos. I'm learning how to use Premiere Pro, After Effects, so on and so forth, and having an amazing time doing it. I'm trying to share my experiences with the world. Uh, in the meantime, I'm also trying to show people that there's a lot of area out there that is, uh, I wouldn't want to say unexplored, but is totally explorable to all of us in the general public. Uh, a lot of people don't know that there's a lot of, in, I'm from the Bay Area near San Francisco, I'm about two hours north. Uh, within two to four hours, there is an abundance of BLM land, national parks, state parks that you can go camp in. Uh, the state uh, parks, they're great and wonderful and all, but personally, I'm a national forest kind of guy. BLM, a lot of that land is not quite as pretty, but they offer you a lot of flexibility, a lot of chance to have some freedom, if you will, to go out there and ride your bikes and bring you shoot your guns and so on and so forth. Whereas the national parks, you got uh, more more restrictions uh, in which you can do, but the beauty is immense out there. Uh, a lot of the national forest, the Mendocino National Forest to be specific, offers a dispersed camping, which is fantastic. It means that you're not gonna have to stay at say KOA. Uh, KOA is a wonderful place. If you want power, you wanna run your generator in your RV, uh, be able to do laundry, take a shower, that's great. If that's your style, uh, all, more power to you. Me, I'm the kind of guy that, yeah, I'm going to bring power with me, whether it be a generator, a small generator, or uh, a battery bank and an inverter. I'm going to bring water. I'm going to bring a small radio. But I'm going to go find a spot that is far away from anybody. Generally speaking, I'm going to be, say, 20, 30, 40 miles away from the nearest town. Uh, I'm going to do my best to, say, be 3, 4, 5, 6, 20 miles from anybody. Um, a lot of the time, my newest favorite places to go are up off FH7. I go up the 101 to uh, Highway 162, which people don't know actually changes into Forest Highway 7. From there, you can follow that up into, uh, say, Pleska Meadows. Uh, I've been up in there in about two and a half hours. Uh, wake up, grab some coffee, head out, and I can have my pole in the water and fish on the line within, say, three hours. Uh, generally speaking, I've limited out in an hour and a half with five beautiful trout that are delicious and taste nothing like... Um, like trout farm trout. Now, granted, you're going to catch more well, more trout in a trout farm, but they're not very tasty. So when you get out there, though, uh, by Pleskett Meadows, uh, in that area, you can be to Black Butte in uh, half an hour. Keller Lake is absolutely amazing. Granted, it's a little pin spot on, on the map, and it's really hard to find unless you can find, uh, have someone who, well, actually, I've got a video with the location of. Uh, the algae colors are beautiful. The trout that are in there are colors I've never seen before. Uh, both times I've been there, I haven't seen another soul. I've never even heard another car. Um, I went up to Anthony Peak a couple of times. It's just shy of 7,000 feet. The view is spectacular up there. The guy in the uh, that mans the tower both times has been very friendly. They even have a public bathroom up there. Uh, and uh, I made it with my Subaru. I've made it with my truck. And again, they're both completely stock. This time of year, you're not going to make it because of the altitude and the snow. But it, if you go in the summertime, amazing view. Uh, there were other people up there, but everyone's friendly. Um, when you go camping up in that area, the when you camp higher up in elevations, you'll find that the greenery is stays green longer throughout the year. It doesn't turn brown quite as quickly as it does down below. Um, with that said, you can go camp and uh, be far away from everybody. Uh, they're not going to bother you. You're not going to bother them. Oh, there's Brian. I just dreamed. Welcome, Brian. I was hey, just up, talking Dylan? about the Pleskett Mountain area, uh, FH7, and how I find that to be one of my more favorite uh, places to go at this time because, uh, 
well, not right now because of the snow, uh, but during the summer, you can go fishing and catch a bunch of uh, rainbow trout. Uh, 20 minutes later, be down to Keller Lake or the top of Black Butte and or uh, drive a little further and be up to uh, Anthony Peak. And the view up there is absolutely spectacular. Um, when I was up there at Anthony Peak all by, uh, with my friends, uh, I met the guys up in the tower, very friendly gentlemen. Uh, if anything, they talked a little bit too much, but that's not a problem. And to take in the view from up there is just unreal. And then to have a public bathroom up there. So after you get that long drive to relieve yourself in something other than a bush is kind of nice. Um, the recent video I just put up of, uh, what was it, Sugar Springs, the fact that you can stay in a campground that only has two spots, that's fantastic. So you get the, you get the, uh, the, the, I forget what kind of toilets those are called, the pit toilets. Um, but you don't have to worry about being at a KOA where everyone is right there and right there and right there and generators run and, and uh, you know, everybody's splashing in the pool and this and that. Now that's fine if that's your style of camping. But to me, I want to be as far away as I can from everybody, because if I want to run the, the stereo, granted, not terribly loud uh, while I'm cooking dinner, I don't want to offend anybody else. And I don't want them to offend me while I'm taking a nap. So um, I always try and get get out there. And it's just, uh, to me, uh, I don't want to say mind boggling, but the amount of area in the Mendocino National Forest that is open to us to disperse camping is phenomenal. There is so much area. I spent a lot of the summer trying to cover as much ground as I could. And it's just a fraction of what's out there. And I know that you get out and go camping quite a bit, too. You've seen quite a bit, and I'm sure that you can agree with me that it, the, the more you explore, the more you the more you just want to explore more and more and more. And uh, if you just bring a small map, I got the uh, map from the Mendocino National Forest for, I think it was like 12 bucks. This map is huge, and the amount of stuff that's on it is amazing. Um, the few times I've run into rangers and uh, – prevention officers they've been more than willing to show me great places hey check this out you might want to go here oh you're into uh photography go check out this spot oh you want a great view to go take the wife up for a sunset oh go up to black butte bring some cheese and some wine and spend the evening the sunset from up there is amazing yeah it's amazing what you can find off the beaten path yeah I mean, absolutely beautiful spots there are. And as I was saying earlier, uh, both my vehicles are completely stock. I drive a Subaru and I have a Chevy, a full size Chevy truck. I have no, the tires are not special. I have no special lift. I have, they're completely stock. Uh, and I've gotten into some amazing places without ever having to be concerned about being stuck. I have seen people get stuck, but that was because they just weren't using their mirrors. Uh, the lot. I was up once before and met, ran into a couple of deer hunters. The guy thought he'd be nice and let his underage kid drive. Well, that was great until the kid, uh, he wasn't paying attention and didn't look in the mirrors and he backed down into a ditch. So the car is pouring in a 90 degree angle straight up. But fortunately, we happened to I'll be flying the drone around, uh, found him. And we're able to pull them out without even having to touch the throttle. Yeah. Uh, another aspect that I really like about uh, going to the national forests is you're allowed to fly your drones out there. Uh, in the state parks uh, and whatnot, you cannot fly. You're not supposed to fly without special waivers or permission, which is a, a obtainable, but not very easy. They're not going to give it. To, they're just like applying for a waiver with the FAA. Um, it's not going to be an easy thing, especially after we've had these crashes where one guy crashed down into a geyser in Yellowstone. It's, it's a big no, no. Okay. So, uh, Dylan, where did you get started in your adventurous type camping? Did that come from family members or is that something you took upon yourself? No, Sorry if I missed the beginning. I, um, I was searching for earbuds. <laughs> Not a problem. I actually re realized that I didn't have them in, and I saw you chime in and want the echo. Uh, no, my my whole family's been big on camping, uh, from my uncle to my dad. Um, with my dad, though, he was always a minimalist camper. We would drive a Dodge minivan, um, and if it didn't fit inside, we couldn't bring it. And uh, we always hauled our own firewood uh, and telescope equipment. And I'm not talking about a small little telescope. I'm talking about you know two feet in diameter and probably three or four feet long, and a stand that stood as tall as me as a child with these big giant legs. Um, and if it didn't fit, it didn't matter. Telescope and wood took top priority. Um, so with that said, I got introduced into camping in a minimal style 
but then in my later years, uh, I got turned on to dirt bikes. <laughs> I was kind of hooked from there. Then from there, it was, okay, well, I'm taking the truck. Oh, well, I've got the truck. I'm going to bring a bigger tent. From there, I'm going to bring a second cooler. Um, I am a glamper. Uh, at this point, I do have a three-quarter ton truck and a six-by-ten trailer, which doubles as my tent. Um, I like to sleep comfortably in my younger age. I don't like sleeping on the rocks. Um, now, granted, that's not – I understand. I have friends that I go camping with that when they come out, they bring a hammock and a sleeping bag. I totally get that. That's fine with them. Um, but I like to have a little more amenities as I get younger and younger. Um, so I have grown to carrying a battery with a pure sine wave inverter to power a couple of lights while I'm cooking. Because lanterns are cool, but I like electricity because it's a little bit quieter. Um, some of the bulbs, I get a little more diversity in how bright it may be. And if I run out of fuel, I don't have to worry about it. I just plug it into the truck instead. Um, I've even kicked it up a notch and recently got a 12 volt cooler, which I am never going back. I have yet to have my food get wet from ice. I don't have to worry about if I go out for a week and a half, I don't have to run back into town and go get ice. Um, those have been fantastic, uh, additions. I've had a Yeti for the past couple of years. A Yeti is a great cooler, but again, ice, it goes bad. Uh, if you forget to drain the cooler, your cheese gets wet. Yeah, camping camping with all those uh, comforts, in, in our group, we call that basic camping. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> you know, everybody pulls in their big toy haulers and uh, set, sets up uh, big army-style canvas tents. Yeah, we, that's basic camping. I've seen you guys almost do like the uh, the wagon circles. Yeah, you got to circle the wagons. Yeah, I've yeah. seen that. You guys sure look like you have a blast out there. I've, I've been talking to a um, I was talking to my brother actually yesterday who's been up to the Oregon Dunes mm -hmm. uh, with his dirt bike. And he was saying we should go out and check out your area because uh, he says that when you ride in the sand, you get hooked real quick. Oh, yeah. I, I was hooked for sure three years ago. Yeah. So what would uh, don't you feel like it doesn't get hot out there and dry? Well, that's why we go down to uh, Dumont around Christmas and New Year's because that's when um, that's when the weather is comfortable. You, you okay. know, your highs of anywhere between sixty to seventy degrees, Ooh. and at night it drops down to maybe the high thirties. Okay. So it's a little unbearable to go down there in the summertime, and a lot of people avoid it mm -hmm. until fall hits, and then that place really starts picking up, especially for like Thanksgiving, Halloween. Uh, Christmas, New Year's. Yeah, I've been uh, following your videos for since I met you, what, uh, I don't know, about six, eight months ago. And uh, one of them I noticed as you were riding, it seemed like it was wagon circle. And then you were riding for like 15 or 20 minutes. And then there's a whole nother wagon circle. And then you're riding for 15, 20 minutes. And there's another one. Now, granted, there's not, it doesn't seem like you guys are all right on top of each other. But that looks like it's obviously a lot of fun if that many people are going out there. So um, that is that is somewhat used as like a safety technique because the riding in the dunes, uh, especially with uh, with it being quite populated with other riders, um, being able to travel in a line like that makes you uh, easier to be seen. Um, and two, you put your most experienced person out front so they can pick the lines, and then you have your uh, your not so good riders, you know, following in trail. And you know that 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 lead person's not going to get everybody into trouble because they've got the experience. Yeah, OK, to watch out for other riders. Oh, watch out. Watch out for other riders. Um, there's way to ways to crest the top of the ridges of the dunes. Um, you know, if in some of these areas, we have people that have gone there for many years. Although the sand does change um, on a month to month basis, you, you kind of know the general winds and mm -hmm. how the dunes are um, set up. Um, example would be like Oregon. We go to Winchester Bay uh, just before early summer. And uh, the winds there predominantly come out of the north, northwest. Okay. So when you're riding out of camp, to into the dunes, you're kind of riding in a southeastern or easternly direction, and that can get you into trouble because when the, the winds blow the sand, it makes it nice, you know, nice little slope, mm -hmm. and then it does an eddy on the back side, the wind does, which makes like a razorback. Oh, so if you're just hauling butt, 
And I've done this a couple of times. Um, you can come up to a five foot drop and you got to decide, am I going to slam on the brakes or, or try to pin the throttle and, and ride down. it out? Yeah. There's wow. a, there's a couple of times on the dirt bike that um, I hit a four foot, five foot drop and um, I didn't have enough speed and the front tire dug in and I did a couple flips. Oh, <laughs> end over kind of. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, oh. um, Winnemucca, when we ride there, the winds, um, it's hard to judge where they're coming out of. They come out of many different directions. And I've heard of a lot of people saying, um, riding there for the first day, they looked at their friends and said, we're going home. You know, the, oh. these dunes are way too technical for us. Um, cause but it sometimes can be a lot of fun. <laughs> I like it. Yeah. Okay. And then, uh, Dumont, um, it all, the winds kind of come mainly out of the North, uh, but they're steep. Um, but there's some witch's eyes that can catch you off guard too. What's the, a witch's it, eye? It's basically, um, say you have a flat dune or, you know, you can have an incline or whatever. Um, but in a particular spot, they will just be this inverted cone. Mm -hmm. So if you're riding full bore and you hit an inverted cone, um, oh. depending on how steep it is, uh, you can go tumbling in the bottom or, or catch your front end and you can do flips. So oh. that, that's why it's always best to have the experienced rider out in front leading the pack okay. because they lead you safely. So you had mentioned uh, temperature over in there, and it was like mm -hmm. the 60 to 70 degree range. Uh, that was something I wanted to touch back on because that's been my experience going back up to uh, on the FH7 area. Um, a lot of the temperatures when I've, I've left back here in Windsor and it's like 95 degrees, I'll get up there and it's like 72 mm -hmm. all day all day uh in the evenings it drops down into like the mid 40s um so for me getting up into that area uh is is really important um another area we used to go to all the time was whole mountain uh which is beautiful and has some great vistas but it's packed full of people there's always right. people there uh, i would never stay in the valley i've stayed down in the valley a couple of times by the airstrip it, it's a big no-no uh down in uh, i think it's oak flat uh, the last several times I've been down in there, I hear nothing but bad things. One time it was just a guy who had a stroke and hit full throttle and slammed into a tree. And that's the least of the worries. Uh, but um, Whole Mountain has some beautiful camping up in there. But one of the favorite drives to do is to start in Potter Valley, go through um, uh, Lake Pillsbury, up over Whole Mountain, follow M1 all the way to FH7, and then either turn right and head east on FH7 or continue on uh, M1 north up into the Indian Deck area, which is actually where I'm planning on going probably next weekend. Um, nice. Granted, weather permitting and snow permitting, uh, more of the snow and the ice. Um, but the temperature and the climate being up in there, and one of the things I was mentioning before you came on is that I find uh, – up in those higher elevations that the, the 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 greenery or the plants stay green for so much longer in the season you'll be over at uh, whole mountain and things are hot and dry by mid-june and july you'll go over and uh by Pleskett meadows and things are still green and lush uh and that is really uh an advantage to me and still have um like an eighth of the number of people that you would over on say whole mountain side of uh the mendocino national forest um one of my next things i want to try and branch out to do is go re like hit the i5 and go all the way to the top of uh mendocino national forest and check out some of that because i haven't been up in there but i've hit the m4 the m6 the m1 uh i think i hit m10 i i'm losing track of all these m roads and m just so for those who are not aware m stands for mountain highway uh, and i'm not one of the things i've always been puzzled with is why does why is it m1 and then there's fh7 there's forest highway 7 but not mountain highway you know it's like well how does that work i don't understand i don't know if you happen to know that answer or not no i don't think i would have an answer for you on that one hmm. um yeah i don't know if it's associated with the county or because i know at one time it was a pr proposed highway mm -hmm. uh, so i don't know if they renamed it thinking that it was eventually going to be a highway or something. I, I don't know. Yeah. I don't know. I, I know that uh, FH seven, I don't know if it has anything to do with the name, but the, the road, the quality is, is, is smooth. 
uh, compared to a lot of the M roads and especially the N roads. The N roads can be smooth, but they can also be where you want something with a very capable vehicle in some cases. Uh, you get back in there and you find that no one goes back in there. So you're going to find some great terrain and uh, great areas to stay. But in some cases, I'll get up in there and go, uh oh, I'm backing out now. <laughs> so uh, hey, I'm going to come back with my buddy with a TRD and a locker and let's see what's right. back in there. But I'm not going to do it in the Subaru. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. If you're going to do any kind of heavy exploring like that, you definitely want to have another rig with you or something that's set up with a winch. Yeah. Um, so you can get self recovery. When I go out, if I go out by myself, I actually have a Google Doc set up. So in that Google Doc, I have my license plate number, my year, make, and model. I have a picture of myself, um, a picture of the car, but I also in there have contact information. So I'm going to say that uh, John Smith uh, knows where I'm going and when I expect to be back. Um, I have uh, Jane Doe. She's really good at recovery. Um, I have so and so. Um, let's say, uh, you know, Brian has uh, is really good with drones and owns a couple. Uh, if, so if I'm stuck, uh, my family members can fall back on that Google document and go, okay, I'm going to call X, Y, and Z. I'm going to call on the troops, and he's already got it set up. Also within that, I'm going to. I always carry at least one radio, if not two, and extra batteries. And on that Google Doc, I'm going to say, in this day, I'm going to be on channel say 16.1. Um, now, when I like to use uh, 16 and above, because those are all GMRS, you're going to have a higher wattage. If you use anything below 16, you're going to be an FRS and be like a half a watt to one watt. Um, so the signal strength is going to be far stronger if you use 16 and above. Um, yeah, and I, I do believe with the GMRS, you need a license for. Five watts and above you do. Unless so you it's can, family. You can use a, a GMRS right. as long as below five watts. So it's like on this radio, I think it's only like two and a half watts. <laughs> so mm. you're not you're not going to get in trouble. Um, and uh, at some point, I'd love to get the ham operator's license because uh, I was out with a friend once who is huge on ham. He's got a lot of money, and he in his truck he had a self tuning antenna and five different radios. We were in the middle of nowhere, and he mm -hmm. was making phone calls. Yep. He piped into the thing, and he was hitting repeater. It was going to repeater, 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 and then hitting a phone service. Mm -hmm. uh, in that sense, you're never going to be in trouble unless nope. you uh, are, are unconscious. Uh, but in both my vehicles, I have uh, OnStar for, uh, I don't know what it is in the Subaru, but I subscribe to OnStar. So if my airbag goes off, my location's beamed up, and they're going to, you know, are you okay? Yes or no? Um, so I'm just going over some different fail safes that I carry so that in case something happens, also these have weather. So if I'm out in the middle of nowhere and I am in trouble, I'm going to know what's coming, hopefully. Um, and, yeah, it's good to carry some extra water, some extra toilet paper, and a space blanket, uh, a shovel. I mean, we go on for days with recovery gear. It's good to carry, but those are some of the essentials. But to me, one of the primary things is having a plan that your family can fall back on and know where you're going to be, what time you right. expect to be back, um, and who they can contact to get help other than necessarily uh, because, the, you know, the the police and medical and whatnot are, are there for us. But they you don't want to call them right away and waste the resources when uh, your friend with the drug and your friend with the radio can reach you first because then you can save those emergency services for when somebody's actually really needing them. Right. And I think there's some, uh, Garmin makes a unit too, don't they, that you pay like five bucks a month for that you can they, actually send texts and stuff through? Yeah, they have one. I don't know what the monthly subscription is, but I believe it's like 25 cents to re per text to send and receive and all you need is satellite signal. I used to own a Garmin called the Rhino. Uh, and with that unit, it had uh, up to five watt radio. It had uh, now they have SD cards so you can store a ton of information with topo maps, regular maps. But the thing that really sold me on it was that you could pull someone's position. So hypothetically right. speaking, I'm out riding my dirt bike and I, I hit one of those uh, uh, which whatever you're calling where you fall into a ditch um, and I'm unconscious. I can't respond on the radio. Well, as long as I'm within radio range and someone else has a Garmin, they can pull your position and know where you are within 10 feet. To me, that's almost a lifesaver. And they did, uh, back when I had them, they had uh, several different series. And I think they started at like 200 bucks and went all the way up to like $700. So you didn't have to buy the expensive one. Yeah. Um, but these are all these are all things that uh, are good to know that are at least out there. You might not want to drop the money right away because you might not be as avid as an outdoorsman who's like going out every other weekend like me. Um, but it's good to know what's out there. And if you do have the budget, uh, it's like a spare tire uh, or a car jack. You hope to never need it. But when mm. you do, you want to have it. 
Yeah, every time I go for a drive or, you know, if it's in our camping trips, I always I always think, you know, what happens if my tire has a leak? Do I have the equipment to fix it? You know, just think of those kind of situations and it, are you prepared? Um, mm -hmm. you know, my truck um, and also in the Can-Am, we always carry tire plugs. I got an air compressor in the trailer, the truck, and the Can-Am. Mm -hmm. uh, because if you don't have tires that are rolling, you're pretty much <laughs> yeah. stuck. you're really stuck. You're going for a walk and hope you got a backpack. Right. You know, another thing that you think of too is um, something that can disable a pickup pretty dang quick is your belt. Yeah. Yes. Fan belt. Yes. Um, every time I replace my fan belt with a new one, I always put the old one behind the seat. Yeah. Now, do you carry a wrench to change it? Yes. Okay. I got a full toolkit that always stays under my back seat along with extra oil and all that. You got to keep the, the heart living in those trucks to get back home. Yeah, absolutely. That's, uh, you know, having your water pump running, your power steering pump and all that stuff. It's one thing to lose your alternator because uh, in some of the cars, as long as you turn off the radio and the fan, you're still going to be able to end the lights. You're still going to be able to drive for a really long time. But if that water pump's not spinning, you're, you're dead in the water in moments. Uh, right. If your power steering pump goes out in some of these, like in my, uh, in my diesel truck uh, with hydro boost, uh, I, I, it's two feet pulling on the steering wheel to step on that brake pedal because I have hydro boost and it's not going to stop you. So absolutely carrying extra belts are really important, but uh, knowing how to change it is not that hard. A lot of people look under the hood and they get, oh my God, I'm scared. Uh, there's a ton of videos on YouTube on how to narrow things down. Uh, I have a background in automotive. I went to the JC and went through all of their courses. And one of the things they taught us right off the bat was just stand back and think about things. It's When you look at it, you're going to see a ton of wires, a ton of hoses. But if you just take a minute to relax, wait a second. Okay, that's an alternator. Okay, that runs to the battery. Oh, okay, the belt. Oh, there's a pulley right there. Now, once you learn that tensioner, throw the wrench on there, pull it over. The hardest part is remembering how to put the belt back on. But if you look under the hood, there's a sticker and it's going to tell you the routing pattern. Um, and those things could be invaluable. You never know what information can save you. And I certainly don't want to intimidate people when they go out to, to not go out and explore the woods and think, oh, my God, this might happen to me and I'm just screwed and uh, I'm never going. Please don't feel that way. Don't uh, go explore. Have fun. But knowledge is power and knowledge could save you. Um, some of the safety kit stuff, uh, stuff that I carry, a snake bite kit, um, uh, either a flint and steel or a piston fire starter, those are good to have because even in the winter, uh, if you if you are in the summertime, if you're not par prepared, you know, 40 degrees can make a night very, very long. <laughs> So carrying some of that stuff is important. And there's a ton of channels out there. And I try to introduce, uh, you know, not only where to stay, but different tech. Uh, I just did the cooler one. And I do plan to do more like uh, survivalist, if you will, information, because it's good to know some of that information. I'd like to give a shout out. Looks like we got droned up uh, watching us in the live chat. Oh, hey, that how's it going? Um, yeah, you know, I've I do need to up the my kit in my truck i i know i want to get like a water purifier um i do like a life straw or what are you thinking yeah i i, I wouldn't mind a, a life straw um i've seen the ones with the bag where if you had to bottle it you can fill up the bag and it shoots mm -hmm. it through the straw um i still kind of need to to look into the reviews and and what's the the new up and coming stuff but i know mm -hmm. i probably need to get one in the can-am and and my truck as well yeah, or at minimum, at least some iodine tablets, right. some, or uh, a small little tiny, <laughs> excuse me, um, a small little stove to boil water. Even is is it could be handy because maybe you just want your tea and crumpets in the middle of the day, but yeah. maybe that might save your backside too. I was watching a, another YouTube channel, and it's a guy that does a lot of adventurous type motorcycle riding, and uh, on one of his trips, he decided just to go out for like an hour, maybe a little more hour ride it was just him by himself out through the desert it wasn't supposed to be that big of a deal and he get he got up on this trail and it started getting more difficult and more difficult and more difficult and i think he ended up maybe breaking something on his bike or something like that so he was stuck out in the desert um there was like these mud water holes and if mm -hmm. he if he would have had one of those straws things would have turned out a lot better for him mm -hmm. um but, but basically, at the end of the story, he can't, he finally made it out of the desert, but uh, was severely dehydrated. 
and he could have probably killed himself um, with not having, you know, a pretty cheap, basic tool. Yeah, and all that stuff is becoming more and more readily available. You can find it on eBay. You can find it in Dick's Sporting Goods or all these other places, and they're not that expensive. But, uh, again, it goes back to, you know, you could carry – everything it's just a matter of priorities even if you don't if you have a limited budget like myself buy one thing and then the next time you go out buy another one buy another one because they're things like a life straw they're not that expensive right. they're not expensive at all um, and just slowly grow your collection and then keep it at a little tote and then uh, I, I have several different totes for when I go camping I have uh, for when I go on the bigger trips I have one that's just cords and lights and the inverter uh, I have another one that's just like general camping gear where it's got mosquito netting. It's got uh, those hand warmer packets. It's got a couple of propane cans. Uh, I know I can just grab stuff and throw it in the car. And then I have mm -hmm. smaller ones that are already packed also that sometimes just have camera gear. <laughs> but um, it's good to know this stuff. And uh, that's part of what I'm trying to get out on my channel is to show people that this is possible. There's a lot out there and it should be explored. Uh, the more we explore it and enjoy it and take care of it, uh, the more it'll be available to us to use. Right. Especially if we show the, uh, the the park service that it's being used, they might have more inclination to keep it maintained and open. Um, I know the M1 washed out north of FH7 last year, and they had it fixed right before deer season. Mm -hmm. Right before deer season. I was so impressed. Whereas the couple years prior, um, it, it didn't get fixed for a long time. But enough people called in and said, oh, I'm really, you know, I'd love to see that area open back up. And they fixed it right away. Yeah. Yep. If you want change, you got to voice it. You can't keep it to yourself. Yeah, exactly. But again, it comes back to taking care of it also and self right. ourselves. Uh, there's a lot of good information on, uh, you know, when they talk about dispersed camping, one of the main things they emphasize is clean up after yourself. And while you're there, there's nothing wrong with picking up a couple other things from other people um, and, you know, cleaning it up. No, oh, I see my friend Eric joined in. Hi, Eric. How's it going? How's it going, everybody? Yeah, he's a friend of mine. He's a fishing buddy. He's uh, oh. been uh, teaching me a lot of tips and tricks when it comes to fishing. We go down to Petaluma and uh, we try and go for stripers pretty often. I've been trying to get him to take me to his little private spot to go for some largemouth, but maybe someday. Yeah. <laughs> Although I, I, largemouth is a lot of fun for the fight, but I got to admit, I, I, as a fisherman, I like eating the fish too. So when I get a chance to find out that Pleskett Meadows was stocked that day before, I was on cloud nine <laughs> yeah. and it just so happened. I would just got there that same day. So I was back there with my friend right away and I put up a video pretty quick. As soon as I figured out from four or five different fishermen, what they were using combined all of their stuff. And the next day I limited out in an hour and a half. Mm. I came back to camp with five uh, beautiful trout and they were delicious for lunch. And then she takes some hints from the locals there too. <laughs> Oh, yeah, that's exactly how I learned. Uh, they were using uh, power bait, and then some were also using uh, the, they're called uh, power bait mouse tails. It's got a little white head and then a little, like, looks like a mouse, or a, not a mouse tail, because they don't have really tails, but a, a rat tail. Uh, and just smother, I have a video on it, and just smother the power bait on there. And every cast, I was getting bites. Mm -hmm. Every other cast, I had a fish coming in. And it was, it's, it's amazing. And then to wake up and watch the sun come up on those mountains there, I have a time lapse that uh, I'd love to launch of that. Granted, you can see my flashlight moving all over the place first thing in the morning, but watching the sun come up on that mountain and those trees, you just can't get that back here in the city. And then to not hear the, you know, the tires and the Harleys and stereos and burnouts and sirens, it's uh, disconnect and reconnect is the way I like to yeah. put it. I, I'm not much of a religious man, but it is definitely spiritual. Absolutely. There watching that. Absolutely. Yeah, just sitting there. Uh, I, I have a hard time back here in town just sitting still and watching something. But out there, yeah, I can sit for a long time and just watch, 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 and just let nature go by. It's good yeah. for us. We, we, we're constantly remembering to recharge our laptops and cell phones, but we're not remembering to recharge ourselves. Uh, Mother Nature didn't design us to live in a big city. It designed us to be out there in the forest and enjoy all, all it has to offer. So um, I, I, I'm always encouraging people, come with me, join me on a trip, follow me, or what have you. Let's go friend okay. uh, a new friend let's go there's plenty out there there's a plenty of us plenty of room for all of us to explore and have a great time mm-hmm yeah 
So what is one of the, the things that you hate uh, approaching a campground? Like when you come into a campground, you see the area. What is one of the, I, I know what kind of bugs me. I'm wondering if you, you're kind of on the same lines. A big mess, uh, oh. disorganization and just stuff everywhere. Uh, yeah. Generally it's it's going to be the garbage I find. Right. Around. Or I'll pull into a camp and the fire is 12 feet tall. Right. Uh, I don't haul firewood out there because I try to burn in you know, uh, harvest the fire where I'm going to be burning it. So I carry a small chainsaw. Uh, I'll go hike off into the woods and drag something out into the road and cut it up into the road and then haul it over there. Uh, but I'm only going to make the fire big enough for the group of people I'm with. And even that's within reason. Even if I have 20 people out there, I'm still not going to build a 20 foot fire. Build it just a foot or two high. You don't need to have it uh, that high. If you're cold, put on more layers. Use the fire more for ambiance than heat itself. All right. Or cooking s'mores. <laughs> you know, they're delicious. Yeah. One of the big ones for us when we go out camping uh, with the family is um, just the place is becoming littered with trash. Um, I, I've always taught my kids, you know, to clean up around camp when you can. And then uh, as soon as we get all packed up and ready to leave, we all do a walkthrough. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't matter if it's our trash or someone else's trash. Uh, we make sure the whole area is clean by the time we leave. Leave it cleaner than you found it. Exactly. Yeah. And that goes with your casings, too. If you're a target shooter, mm -hmm. it goes up, too. They, they do decompose, but they take a very long time. Uh, also, with people like me who like to walk around in bare feet, I could end up cutting myself. And right. I, that's the last thing I want to do is step on a, shell, a piece of shell or a you know, some sort of 357 round and have it go up into my foot and then my trip's over. It's done. Right. And that's no fun. Who wants that? And then, uh, you know, especially out in the dunes, we noticed that uh, people like burning pallets. Oh, that's and, a big no-no. And what's in pallets? Yeah, pallets, pressure-treated wood, all kinds of paint and nasty. And nails, nails, too. Nails. Uh, yep. I can't imagine the nails are any part of good for your Can-Am. So, especially in the dunes where you don't have... Because a lot of times you, when you go out to the dunes, it's it's generally BLM land or um, there is some Forest Service land. But the campgrounds aren't designated. You can just go out there anywhere, set up camp, have a bonfire. Well, yeah. when you leave and you've left that burned pallet that is now nails mm -hmm. all over the ground and somebody mm -hmm. heads to their new campsite and runs over where your fire was or, yeah, you got all the toys um, out there riding around that's running through that as well. I mean, you're you're causing a bad day to a lot of people. Yeah, or uh, God forbid hurting somebody too. You get a flat yeah, right. front tire hauling backside and when you're Can-Am or on a dirt bike, it's only two wheels, you're mm -hmm. going to endo and that could end uh, in catastrophe and not be good in any shape or form. So how does that work for dispersed camping out there where you are? Do, you, do they make you look for a fire ring and some sort of established road where you're not, I mean, I guess it's sand, so there is an established yeah. road. Is, do you have to look for an established fire ring? No, no uh, it's like say Dumont. Uh, when you come out of the front gate, you climb this little, you know, you climb this little hill and then it just kind of plateaus out and you, mm -hmm. it's BLM land. So you can go out there and camp anywhere you want. Okay. Um, so we generally take a left and we go out and camp on one of the, the further uh, small ridges just to mm -hmm. be elevated from the dust. Okay. And uh, the ground there is mostly sand mixed in with some, uh, some rock that might be four or five inches wide. Um, maybe a bush here or there. Um, you just kind of gather up some rocks, make a little fire ring and have your fire in it. Um, just make sure that it's always, you know, someone always has an eye on it. Mm -hmm. Um, if everybody, you know, it's going to go to sleep or everybody's going to go on a ride, you just got to make sure to extinguish it. Yeah. If you leave it, it's probably not going to catch anything on fire, but it's always a, a good standard to, good one, habit with, to put with that, that stuff. Said, one of the things I read recently, there's a very good, uh, let's call it a landing page on the Mendocino National Forest about uh, campfires. Uh, and Cal Fire does a very good video on their recommendations of having a fire in the in, out in the woods. Um, but one of the things I read on there is uh, that I was, I, I was glad to read, but I was also surprised. Um, hypothetically, someone starts a fire in your campground in your group everyone in that group is copy is culpable for that fire everyone 
So if my if John Smith lights the fire, but I'm still in camp and John Smith goes to sleep and then I go to sleep, I'm just as liable as he is. Yeah. So even though I told him, hey, dude, I'm not with this is not my fire. I'm not a part of this. It doesn't matter in the eyes of CDF or uh, Cal Fire. You're still going to get in trouble for having that fire. So uh, if you see someone lighting a fire and you don't, it's uh, out of fire season, you don't have a fire permit, there's no fire ring, uh, on and on. Um, again, watch the video. Cal Fire does a very mm -hmm. detailed job. Um, remember that you can get in just as much trouble. So it's a good idea to uh, check those regulations, have the campfire permit, and they're not hard to get. You can get them from any ranger, prevention officer, or I think you can get them online. I've seen the application mm -hmm. online, at least. Yeah. California, in California, um, Cal Fire's got a web page that you, I think you get on there, you watch a video, it's got a simple little questions at the end. Once you uh, pass the test, uh, you get a certificate online saying that you passed it. And then all you got to do, a lot of guys take their cell phone, they actually take the test on their cell phone. So when the certificate comes up, you know, they do a capture screen. Of oh, it. Okay. And then, it, you know, everybody always takes their phones, no matter where they go. Um, with a piece of paper, you know, you might misplace it but you've always got your phone and with that certificate in your your photo library you've always it's got true. it true uh, i was on the mendocino national forest website yesterday looking at uh, regulations of dispersed camping and actually found uh on the top left was a site map from there it was extremely easy to find any of the information i needed to find far easier actually than using the navigation below it um mm -hmm. i just hit site map and then every single little topic came up uh, so there's basically no excuse to, to, to know the information that's out there. And uh, I did put up a link. Uh, I have a video launching, I think, next weekend on dispersed camping. I go over some of the little basics about it. And, nice. and in, in the description, I do put a link to the uh, Forest Service website, actual landing page about dispersed camping and out there. Because um, they do talk about there is a minimum distance from a campground you have to stay. There's a min maximum number of days you can stay. There are some regulations, but they're not that hard to follow. There's not that many. So please do not be intimidated whatsoever about those. Yeah, I've been just, doing what? just do your research before you go. I mean, like you said, due diligence yeah it, and it's not hard they make it very easy to find uh the restriction fire restrictions are obvious are posted on every single page uh, on the top right corner uh restrictions for ohv road closures they're all very simple to find on the uh, i love the mendocino national forest right. website for that reason plus uh finding the for the offices to, to drop in and actually talk to a person it, that's easy too when i go up through fh7 i stop in Cobolo and just say hi and introduce myself and look and see what new maps they have or what updates they have Right. Or, it doesn't hurt to stop in and see, uh, yeah, if something has changed since you've been up there last. Absolutely. And when I talk to like fish and wildlife, I always have that like, I feel like I'm talking to a cop and I'm a little bit nervous. Mm -hmm. But every time I've talked to a park ranger, a prevention officer, or anybody in those offices, I've always felt very welcomed. And I never felt like any question I asked was a stupid question. They always yeah. answered them. They never rolled their eyes. Mm -hmm. It always went so smoothly. Um, and that's one of the things I love about the National Forest um, is you get a lot more freedom, but also they treat you with respect and dignity, for lack of any other phrase, sorry. <laughs> yeah, so with one of the trips that we were going to go up to uh, Winchester Bay, um, I, I fly paramotors as well. And I wasn't sure if I could fly the paramotor um, in the sand dunes. So I looked up the ranger station there online, gave them a call. Talked to the uh, the receptionist and told her the question that I had that I, that I fly paramotors and I was you know wondering if I could launch from from their land there and she's like well I don't know but give me your number I'll call you back um, once I find the answer mm -hmm. okay fine and within like a half an hour she called me back and said yeah there's absolutely no problem. Oh, yeah. And that's can, the, uh, you, you're flying basically a uh, parachute with a motor on the back, right? Yeah, it's considered an ultralight. Okay. Uh, it's an oversized paragliding wing uh, with a two stroke motor strapped to your back. Uh, they do come in a backpack form, or you can get trikes or quads. Those are the ones with wheels or like little carts. Oh. Um, make it easier to take off or land or? Uh, the, the wheeled units, you know, you need to, uh, smoother type ground yeah they do have balloon sized wheels on them um, yeah 
but the foot launch that's kind of the way i went because you can launch and land and and trickier trickier areas and mm -hmm. tighter areas okay um, so yeah how did you get into that that's uh, that seems like a, a fun thing to do and is it is it as hard as the part 107 to pass it's a, it's one it's under uh 103 okay. and it's considered an ultralight so it's uh it is uh what's the word i'm looking for uh, i can't think of the name um self-regulated so you don't need a license for it you didn't so you didn't need to take any test no but i did you say that with hesitation though so if, if someone just buys a paramotor and tries to fly they're probably going to kill themselves there, there's a lot of learning that you need to do um you can't gain it all from youtube you could try but you may kill yourself uh but my dad and i we ended up going down to southern california signed up for a class there at the salton sea and uh got trained up took us uh i think it was like seven days oh um so in order to pass the class you had to get uh i think it was 21 foot launches within those seven days and then do all the, the curriculum that they have. Um, but yeah, it's it's a, I've always wanted to fly ever, ever since I was a little kid. Uh, when I lived out at the ranch, we, uh, the corporation had a uh, Super Cub and a Cessna and my super uncle cub. flew. Yeah, Super Cub. And uh, every time my uncle started that plane up, I, I just started running to the hangar because I wanted to go for a flight. <laughs> yeah, I um, too. But life caught up, bills got tight. I never got to go get my pilot's license. And and looking on YouTube, I came across this guy named Tupper, Tucker Gott. Um, he's like the big YouTuber for, for the sport. And just watching his videos um, really inspired, inspired me that this might be a cheap way of, of being able to fly. And uh, it, it's considered the dirt bike of the sky. Okay. So, um, if what, like the guy, free? well, you put it this way, you know, the guys that fly in a jet, they fly to point A to point B, boom, really fast. Okay. The guy in an airplane, like say a Cessna or a Super Cub, yeah, they could go a little slower. They can see the scenery. Um, they can circle around, check out a lake, whatever. Well, the paramotor pilot can fly a foot off the ground. He can skim the water with his foot. Um, you can carve around trees, around Ooh. little, you know, the foothills. You're, you can do all the low stuff, but yet you can go super high, too. Um, I, myself, I, I uh, right here in the valley, I got up to uh, 5,000 feet. Uh, Ooh, <laughs> shut, the, shut the motor off, and it took me uh, 10 minutes to glide back down to 1,000 feet. Oh, that would be amazing. I like to do that sometimes on my downhills on the bike is just turn it off, put it neutral and just, right. you never know what you're going to stumble into. There'll be a bear around the corner. That's like, Oh, I didn't even know you were coming. I didn't hear you. So, but, but you were saying how to, you know, you were sitting on a mountain watching the sunset. Yeah. Try to do that in a lawn chair in the sky, mm, just crossing right. along and, and looking and just watching the sunset from, from 5,000 feet. Right. It, it is a, uh, it's awesome. All right. So speaking of dirt bikes, one of the things that I've been learning is, and uh, I've acquired some of the OHV maps, is uh, is learning that there is actually some riding out there in the national forest. Now, granted, there's a fair a lot a lot over in the Pillsbury side, but a lot of the end roads are actually open. Uh, some of them might have the sign broken off, but uh, when I went into the Covalo station, uh, I found maps abundantly easy to find. Uh, and I've seen a number of people out there just strolling around in their quads, side by sides, dirt bikes. And uh, for the most part, they're not ripping it up. They're just tooling around, which is one of my favorite things to do um, is to put the bike in the back of the truck and just go cruise around for the day. Um, now, granted, sometimes I have to put it back in the truck and go down FH7 or what have you and then go to the next end road. Uh, but is that your experience also that a, most of the end roads, unless posted otherwise, are open to OHV? Um, so I would suggest anybody that's going to be going to the Mendocino or any other forest, um, definitely stop in at your local forest ranger office mm -hmm. and one, talk to the people there, um, especially because you've ridden in the, like the upper lake area. Have you? Yes. Which I don't and, think is open right now. The upper lake ranger district. There's a lot of closures. 
There's um, a sign at the, uh, which is kind of conflicting because there's a sign at the base of Pillsbury saying closed, but when you check the website, there's no mention of it being closed. Yeah, I think it's on there. Um, it's kind of hit. You've got to search for it. Huh, it used um, to be it, prominent right there on the top right hand corner yeah. by the uh, fire restrictions. Um, but uh, that Upper Lake and the Stony Ford um, OHV area, I, I actually watched it on a, a YouTube channel. They were doing uh, California's five top places to four wheel. And uh, that area was actually number five on their list. Okay. But um, that area has got a lot of uh, anything from street vehicles only to um, Jeeps, mm -hmm. like Jeep trails, Jeep and pickup. Mm -hmm. um, they, they, and it drops down even to 50 inches or less. That's why I ended up. Uh, what? What, what, what's that distinction? Okay. Is that width or length? Width. Okay. So you're talking like four wheelers. Mm -hmm. um, I, that's one of the reasons why I first bought the Polaris 900 trail, because that was one of the, the only, well, I wouldn't say only, but it was one of uh, the UTVs on the market that can actually legally ride those trails because okay. it was like all, exactly 50 inches. Okay. <laughs> and then those trail system, systems will even drop down into motorcycle only. Okay. And uh, from what I've seen, most of those have been signed quite well at the entry points of each one of those trails. Mm -hmm. um, but you can stop into the offices and pick up an OHV map. And those OHV maps, I know they have one for Stony Ford and they should have one for Upper Lake. And that's the motor vehicle use map. So that's like the whole forest. Okay. Um, but they actually have a state granted uh, beautiful. How about something yeah. like this? Yeah, that's that's the that's the one. Okay. So within this, this is going to show us where we're allowed to use a Jeep, a quad, a bike, so in, on and so forth. In the Stony Ford and Upper Lake area. Yeah, if you're going to go in those areas, that's the map you're going to want. Okay, so I've got another one here for Upper Lake, Upper Lake yep. which I believe is closed right now. Uh, I have been seeing people ride up there quite a bit. Uh, but again, down at the base, there is a sign that's very prominent that says closed to OHV with a phone number. Um, but I used to see back in the B earlier this summer, there was, it was very prominent on the website. Uh, it is closed. But I'm not seeing that. Um, but anyway, so another topic I would bring up is uh, for those that really want to get far away from everybody, absolutely away from everybody. Uh, there's a game refuge in the National Forest, and I think there's actually a couple of them. Um, you go back in there, there's no OHV allowed and no firearms allowed. So if you want some truly private camping where you're, the last time I was in there, I think I was in there in August for four days, I saw one car the entire time I was there. There, No one goes in there. Because everybody wants to ride OHV or they want to go up there and target shoot or what have you or go hunting. Um, so for those that are trying to truly get away and have the complete opposite of the KOA experience, look for the state game refuge. I think it's uh, M6 uh, near Pillsbury is a, a pretty good stretch run, uh, a pretty good stretch through there. There's a couple of spots. I have uh, two videos where you can camp right on the river, uh, one of which had plenty of swimming holes. Uh, the one next to, uh, if you go to Trout Creek, which is kind of hard to find on the map, you go about two more miles down the M6, there's a huge swimming hole and the water is perfect in the middle of summertime. And the best part is there's no one back there. No one mm -hmm. goes in there. So if you want to be alone with the wife and have a, a real picnic, granted the hike down is pretty steep, but it's sand. So you're not going to fall on rocks and break your arm. Um, that would be something I would highly recommend to get far, far away from everybody is the game refuge. Uh, if you want to get even further away from people, check out the wilderness area. Granted on that you're on foot or horseback. There is no vehicles. Um, but that's going to offer you, if you're into backpacking, which I do have friends that do that, you're going to see stuff that 99.99% of the public are not ever going to see in their lives because nothing's allowed back in there except primitive camping and on foot, uh, what you can carry on your back. Yeah. So yeah. drone up, he says y'all should review some drone fail views and talk about them. That might be a good subject here. One of these nights. Oh yeah, absolutely. <laughs> I, uh, I crashed my drone once, but I wasn't able to, uh, recover the uh oh yeah okay now i see it it's a little bit slower on my end um 
I crashed mine, but I wasn't able to recover the footage. Actually, Eric was there. Mm. Uh, I was flying down the Petaluma River, uh, and uh, I did. They have these giant metal uh, PG&E towers across the river because they have big boats that go underneath. Well, I was standing at the base of it, but I didn't realize what pole I was standing at. I was standing at the further back pole, and I came screaming down the the to get the footage of the bridge as I'm flying down the river. Well, I slammed into the pole I thought was behind me was actually in front of me. <laughs> so at about 35 miles an hour, wham, drone hits the pole, falls to the ground, and it hit gimbal first. Mm. So my Mavic 2 Pro was done. Oh, but wow. fortunately, I had the Care Refresh program, 150 bucks. I had a brand new drone. Uh, mm. DJI has been wonderful to me. Um, when I crashed it then, that one time, I just paid the deductible. There was no, I told them what I did. <laughs> I mm. didn't hide anything. And I got another one a few days later in the mail. Um, I had a battery go bad that I bought off eBay. And they just said to send us the receipt. And then a week later, I had a brand new battery for my Crystal Sky. Uh, I love DJI. Uh, I unfortunately don't have a crash compilation because I try very hard to not crash. Um, but yeah, as I was talking yeah. about earlier, quads, uh, uh, live stream, I try to pretty much fly in tripod mode because it's going to be more cinematic and a lot smoother than flying in Addy mode, which is going to be just basically showing off. But I'm sure Eric remembers that flight. <laughs> I, I should give you one of my photos of me crashing my drone. Oh, absolutely. You have a drive, uh, uh, compilation? <laughs> not, uh, not yet. I, I, I started my first one anyways. What now, happened? I, uh, well, I had this like epic shot I was going to do it. This uh, I had the the ocean in the background. I was on the top of uh, Banshee Hill, okay. And the plan was on the backside of Banshee Hill. I was going to, you know, have the drone. It was going to show the sand dune, mm -hmm. and then I was going to come forward and up, and then reveal the ocean behind. Mm -hmm. And where Banshee Hill comes up, there's trees on both sides, so it yeah. kind of gives like this perfect window of the ocean. Well, being uh, I, I was an RC pilot um, for a while. And I'm pretty good with controls, but th with the drone being all kind of new, I hit the wrong inputs. And instead of going up, I went forward oh, and no. I did a, a prop strike in the sand, which uh, one of the arms and I think it was the front arm folded halfway. And I, I brought it up and I sat there hovering with one arm halfway. And then all of a sudden it snapped closed and the whole thing flipped upside down. Oh. And landed oh. <laughs> it so the sand. Just a little less impact, and that arm might have stayed or popped back into place. Yeah. Oh, how bummer. I, I, I tried some, to kill it as soon as I could. Yeah, I think that's uh, out and down and out to shut the props down, if I remember correctly. Oh, Eric says, yes, he does remember that crash. <laughs> so so I, I boxed the thing up, and uh, I, I called a place. Um, it's not Sacramento. It's the town. Uh, just west of it. Um, but I, I was in touch with one of the uh, service guys there and he said, yeah, just come down for a hundred bucks. We'll open it up, go through it, clean all the sand out, make sure everything is savvy mm -hmm. and then ship it back. And I did that and the drone is still flying today. Oh, well, that's awesome. One of the things I recently uh, learned about the, uh, the drones, uh, my Mavic 2 has, uh, I think it's close to 200 or 300 flights uh and 400 miles covered of ground yeah. um my battery's starting to really suffer I, I last time i was up on whole mountain it was granted it was cold uh after a battery and a half i was down to 20 percent in my transmitter oh, wow. um i didn't know it but apparently the fcc will not allow transmitters to be repaired you have to buy a new one hmm. yeah, yeah apparently there's there's too much possibility for someone to go in there and tamper with the signal strength and turn okay. it up so they make it so you basically have to buy a whole new one. So I unfortunately going to be buying a new one. Now, when it comes to crashes, my closest calls would be with the FPV and flying through the trees. Uh, I'm notorious for sitting back in a lawn chair when we're camping with the FPV tethered to the uh, camera gimbal and just flying very slowly, but trying to see what I can squeeze through. Uh, and I have bounced off of branches before, and I don't know how I didn't crash, but I've had it go back and forth. Uh, another time I was actually flying over water and I got really lucky. I heard it from a hundred yards out, you know, hit the branch. 
and somehow it recovered and didn't fall in the water. I have no idea how. So I've come pretty close to having my own drone compilations, but so far it's only the one, and I didn't wasn't able to recover the footage. <laughs> so uh, have you? Do you have any experience in the? Is it the FPV uh, racing type drones? No, but I want to so bad. I was just talking yeah. about that yesterday with my brother. Uh, the, the closest thing I have to that is the FPV goggles with the right. Mavic 2 Pro. Um, granted, uh, when I watch these guys fly through buildings and stuff, uh, I start to salivate. I almost need a bucket. I've got to, I've got to send you this this video. Um, of course, it's on YouTube. But the guy built one of those drones, and he put a, a GoPro mount on it. Mm -hmm. And uh, of course, we're it's out in the sand dunes. But you got this rail. I think it's uh, uh, what's his name? Anyways, he was he was in the sand in a rail, and he hit the throttle, and he he was doing a wheelie, and that guy brought that drone in and just came right underneath him like this, getting the whole oh, under. He's like, oh my god, that would be epic. For and he's sure. like. You know, the guy's like ripping around the sand and that little drone's just like right behind him. And, and he comes up around as like a full 360 around him. And I was like, oh, my God, that's just amazing. <laughs> that's some epic footage. That oh, would be, man. Uh, that would be fantastic to have. That's, you're always looking for that cool, unique shot. And that's definitely a cool, unique shot that not many other people are going to have. Yeah, you think of a guy that flies like that and how many of those he has crashed in his mm -hmm. life trying mm -hmm. to get that good but it takes oh, a man. lot of experience but some of the crap when i watch some of those guys fly it's almost like those things are made of uh like titanium they don't right. break mm -hmm. i mean they do break um but i've seen somebody shot at with paintball guns one guy was trying to fly his drone uh camera uh drone about that big through a hole about that big right. and after about 10 attempts and crashed every time he made it but he never mm -hmm. had to change a prop and i don't know how that works because when I fly these things, the props get chipped all over the place. Right. <laughs> I've got a stack of brand new props just to keep them safe. Um, but yeah, flying up in the forest is a lot of fun. Uh, one of my favorite things to do is to put the, have somebody sit down and put the FPV goggles on them and then skim them right across the treetops at about 25 miles okay. an hour. And then let them have the, the head tracking with the gimbal so they can look up and down and left and right. And they're just blown away. They're like It's like being a bird and flying at the treetops. And it's the closest thing you can get to being an eagle that's just kind of soaring along. Uh, and it, it's fun to watch people's expressions. And I, a few times uh, when I first started, I didn't tell people to sit down. Uh, and a few of them had to just collapse. <laughs> they're like, oh, my God. Oh, my God. <laughs> it, it, it's, yeah, it's amazing. But uh, using the, the, the drones up there with like a time lapse or a hyper lapse for the sunset. Oh. Just makes me salivate every time. <laughs> I, I wish we ha would have had you down there, at Dumont, with us. Um, now, one of these days, I want to because we, I mean, we could get some quite the footage with all the cameras and the three drones I've caught. It'd be oh, yeah. We got to go up to Oregon. It, you didn't you say you had a friend or something that lives up in Oregon? No, uh, I do, but they're in uh, Portland. Okay. So I don't know how close that is. I was saying my brother and a few of his buddies went up to some sand dunes uh, last year. They all bought paddle tires and the 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 flag on a pole or whatever. Uh, and went up there for a trip, and uh, watching you and watching them, it, it, it does look like a lot of fun. I got to yeah. find the tires for it, but ah, whatever. Yeah, with the with a drone out doing that kind of stuff, I, I find it pretty difficult. Uh, one, I, I'm I'm new into the drone world, I'm trying to learn the ins and outs of them, I'm failing as I go, but each time I get a little better. Um, but did you watch the Jeep video of those the big iron? Uh, climbing up the sand dunes and you got the jeeps that that were jumping on the, the lower I've flat seen, i've seen most of your videos but the last one i just watched was awe inspiring watching those guys do wheelies was oh my god if you watch oh. that the, the oregon one with the uh <clears throat> with the trucks i i was just happening to just be riding around and i came across those guys and i had the drone with me and i i talked to one of the guys and i always talk to any of the riders that i i tend to want to get the drone out see it you know kind of get their permission to to fly around those guys were super cool They're like yeah go for it so i got i got the drone up and all of a sudden like all four guys just take off in different directions and i'm like freaking out trying to figure out which one to follow with the drone i follow this one guy going up the hill and the jeep over here is doing freaking jumps luckily i had the the gopro on on the on the uh, front of the can-am that would capture it but 
um, I was like totally overwhelmed on where to put the drone and who to follow. And <laughs> you know, even in the, the one down at Dumont, you can notice there's some jerkiness uh -huh. in the controls. It's because I was so excited. I was like, oh my God, this is the greatest shot ever. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, yeah. I think with time, I'll get smoother on the controls. Um, but uh, it, it is so hard unless you're doing like a photo shoot and you're on radios and you, you're telling the guys, this is where I want you to be. This is what I want you to do at this point. When you're trying to pick all that up, um, unscripted is mm -hmm. difficult. <laughs> yeah. Now, so one of my, one of my policies is when I'm out and about is just keep a camera rolling. I have at least one camera rolling, no matter what, if not two or three, um, I have GoPro. The last time I brought my car in for service, I was like, what are these little black things all over your car? Oh, those are GoPro mounts. Because I've got like three in the back, uh, one, two up on the roof, one on the sunroof, uh, two on the hood. Uh, on my truck, I have them on my side view mirrors. I've got them all over the place. Uh, I document everything because you never know what's going to run out in front of you. The last drive I did up uh, heading up over in a middle town, a bobcat ran right in front of us. And I was like, oh, that's great. Good thing I had it rolling at 4K at 60 frames so I can slow it down and see that. Um, and you never know why a covey of quail comes flying in front of you. You never know what cool footage you're going to get when you're out and about. So, yeah, even if it's just a dash cam, I have something we're recording all the time. We were on that uh, Cohasset ride. And the whole ride, I had all, all my cameras on, the big SD cards and all that, and a bear crossed right out in front of Ooh. us. Well, at that time, I didn't know, but my, my film ended up getting corrupted, and I missed it. <laughs> That's a painful one. No, that would have been a cool shot. Yeah, that would have been a cool shot. Uh, yeah. Have you have you had issues with the GoPros with that? I uh I only have a GoPro four and a session, and I've yet to have any problems with them. Uh, okay. I primarily now use my Osmo. The, the if, Os you, if you Osmo can get a, if you if you can get a cheap one, you got to look into the uh, Hero Seven Black. Okay. Um those videos that you're watching on my channel, uh, those are all hard mounted on something that is bouncing and vibrating out through the desert. And that mm -hmm. hyper smooth, it's like, it's almost like it's on a gimbal. You can't yeah, even that, tell. With uh, this, I've had this on the side view mirror of my truck and driving down the road and the camera footage stays stable, but my truck moves up right. and down. But right. This so that's fastened to my truck. Right. Okay, so it sounds like it's it's the the same type of technology. Yeah, there. it's got uh, it's a different term. It's called rock steady, but it's the same sort of thing. It basically crops your footage a tiny bit right. to allow it to move up and down. Yeah. And yeah, it, it's almost like having a gimbal. I do have a camera action camera gimbal, but most of the time I don't use it with that camera. I just try and be stable with it. And it, with the rock steady, it does fantastic. Granted, it does crop the footage a little bit, but that's okay. If I want the footage full size, I'll put it on the gimbal. Right. Or I, I mean, I have a gimbal here. I've got another gimbal over, over here. I've got several different gimbals to choose from. And that, that's generally why I film in uh, two point seven K, um, just for that that cropping issue. Because anything I upload to YouTube's uh, generally ten eighty, mm -hmm. so, so I shouldn't um, suffer, I guess, on quality mm -hmm. if I'm doing the two point seven. Yeah, I always I just go big and I shoot in 4K because it allows me to zoom in digitally if I need to, right. and you can double the size so you can go from 100% to 200% and still have uh, HD quality or above. Right. Um, granted, I'm chewing through hard drive space real quick. <laughs> That's okay. I can buy more external drives. Oh, I see my brother's on here. Very. Yeah. Oh, that's your brother. Yeah, that's him. Nice. So I'm going to take them up to uh, him and another buddy to um, uh, M1 area up towards Indian Dick. Uh, okay. They're going to load their bikes that are plated uh, into the back of our truck, and we're going to drive up into there and see how far we can get. And maybe while I'm there, get some really cool footage of those guys riding around in the forest and um, in some really pretty areas, because I know that area is gorgeous up in there. Uh, one of my absolute favorite places to camp is all right on Rattlesnake Creek right there. And this one campsite that's uh, far away from any other spots. And the river down in there is amazing. I don't know if you've ever seen it, but um, in, uh, let's say, late July, early August, the water's extremely comfortable. I'm a Nancy when it comes to cold water. I don't like it. Uh, that water's perfect. Uh, but it carves through some uh, solid rock. And so it's all real smooth. And some of the pools are just crystal clear. Um, there's some 
sheer walls that are so you can cl uh, rock climb on there and if you fall you push away and you fall in the water hmm. so you can do swimming you can do hiking you can do rock climbing uh and there's no one around to bother you because there's no place to camp anywhere nearby that's not on a slant <laughs> or got humps and tons of rocks so um if anybody's ever looking for a you know a secret spot that's one of my favorites is right where rattlesnake creek meets there's a big bridge that just does a turn right on the m1 uh, amazing place to camp i do have a video uh from I think six months ago on my YouTube channel. Hmm. So are we going to eventually see uh, some snow camping videos on the channel? I hope so. Uh, the only thing holding me back at this point is I need some fresh tires for my truck so that I can pull the trailer out there. But yeah, we uh, we have two Mr. Buddies to choose from. So And I do have a smoke detector and carbon monoxide detector mounted inside there. Um, and I do have every intention of getting out there really soon. Um, nice. Right now, since I've gotten my part 107, I'm focusing really hard on getting all those last little nuances of the... Uh, uh, drone drone laws like flying over property stuff that's not covered in the actual exam itself um so that i can start hitting that really hard tonight i launched a ad on next door saying uh, i'm looking for two or three neighbors with um 10 or more solar panels that are five years or older i'll come scan them for free i get to use the pictures without locations or names I'll give you the pictures and the results also, because as soon as I start going full time, it's going to be 150 to 200 dollars per house. <laughs> so I'm hoping to start building my portfolio while I'm in this hiatus of construction and right between jobs, just focusing real hard on this, uh, on you know, learning how to fly the drones, getting them activated, getting all the expo and all the settings set up just right, so that I don't have that herky jerky stuff and my camera gimbal isn't up down up down up down because that's just not cinematic whatsoever, and that's what I'm going for. Um, as I try to do what I want to try and do for my goal this year, when I'm doing, uh, videos of campsites or campgrounds, uh, is to do a walkthrough, a drive up, a walkthrough, uh, my thoughts and opinions of the site, but then also do an overview with the drone. Uh, lately I've had the lot of previous trips, I've forgotten to launch the drone and so that you can see it from the air. Um, so that's one of my goals is to remember to do that. And now that I've got the 107, I can hopefully start monetizing this and start making some money at it. Nice. I, mean, that, I had to study for months to get that, uh, get that, that, that test passed. But I, I did with a uh, remote pilot 101. I, I couldn't have done it. I watched Tony Northrup's video too many times. Uh, and yeah, there was another guy that's a two and a half hour video. I watched them over and over. I probably watched 10 hours and it didn't do me any good. But I watched, I subscribed to the part 107 or the remote pilot 101 and I passed with an 88% my first time. Uh, and I had serious sleep deprivation because I made the mistake of uh, scheduling my test the day after several days of camping. <laughs> so that was a mistake. But I still got an 88%. So I'll take it. Not bad. Yeah, I'm going to get mine here eventually. Hopefully before I retire. <laughs> it's not that bad it seems intimidating yeah. you just got to break it down to parts but yeah if anybody's looking to do it i, I can't recommend highly enough and i i'm not sponsored by the guy whatsoever uh mm -hmm. remote pilot 101 hands down just passed it and uh not coming yet, up though, right? what's that yeah yeah right hopefully i will <laughs> hopefully he'll be watching and see it um but they're coming up uh i think it's march everyone's gonna have to pass uh not the 107 but even the hobbyists are gonna have to pass i believe it's 10 questions mm -hmm. online uh, they're going to be very simple, like don't fly in front of airplanes, uh, don't fly over people, um, you know, those kinds of things. It'll be really simple, but everyone's going to have to be licensed to fly, period. Right. And that I, also I think that's how Canada is right now, isn't it? Canada, you have to, from what I understand, you basically need the Part 107 to fly. Yeah. That's at least what I understand after watching Peter McKinnon's videos and a few others. Oh, you that, can't yeah. fly unless you pass the that's basically the Part right. 107. They just but changed it. The, well, I, they might have changed it. I don't know. Uh, last I heard, they basically made it so you could fly anywhere except in front of an airport, but you had to have the license. Right. So they made it really, you know, you can fly wherever you want, but yeah, you got to have the license. Um, but that's, you know, out here for the hobbyists, that's also going to go for airplanes and helicopters. Mm -hmm. You're going to have to have a hobby license. Oh, wow. So it'll be interesting to see what happens in the next couple of years with uh, this new proposed uh, laws with the FAA that are coming out. Uh, of course, every way you watch has mixed emotions and different opinions. But mine is I, I'm fine with everything except for the general public knowing where I'm standing and where I live. 
that I'm, I don't know how keen I am on that one. Of course, law enforcement, that's fine. As long as I'm in compliance, I have nothing to worry about. Uh, uh, the, the tower uh, at the local airport, because I do live with, I'm literally like a uh, hundred yards from the five mile boundary of the airport. So I can't fly at my house without permission. Um, I'm fine with them knowing that. I don't care because I'm flying with permission and I'm flying within the boundaries of the law. But is that, again, is that a powered airport? It's class D. So class yes. D. Yeah. Now, granted, the tower only runs during certain hours. I think they stop at 10. They start at 6 a.m. Um, but, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm literally like right up the street. I can fly without any issues. Are, are you under the ceiling, though? Yeah. Oh, yeah. I'm under the ceiling, but I still I, I'm still going to notify them through Lance. Uh, yeah. I actually also have the tower manager's cell phone number, so I can text oh, him too. Hey, hey, check your email, please, and authorize this flight. Um, but from what I understand, I'm so far away that as long as I'm flying under a couple hundred feet, it's instant authorization through the Lance system. Um, but my problem is I don't want to sign up with Lance until I have my actual card because I don't want to have to take right. down my profile and fill it back out again when my card's due in the mail any day because I passed my test almost two months ago. So I'm hmm. just that close to getting the card, <laughs> being legal. Uh. But yeah, I have plans to go back out next weekend, hopefully to go do some uh, ex exploration out in uh, some part of the national forest and check things out. Um, and yes, I would love to do some snow camping. I, I have all the gear. <laughs> I have no reason not to. I got several heaters, a generator. I actually just got a, a EU to uh, 3000. Uh, was mm. given to me and it's only got one hour runtime on it i was blown away it was a gift i don't i was beside myself you're gonna give me this yeah uh, yeah that's uh camping is in my blood uh i try to get out as much as i can i feel bad that i haven't gotten out but i did just fortunately find a stockpile of footage that i took back in october that i completely forgotten about so I've been making videos off of that, and uh, I think somebody commented, oh, it, there's no snow up there? Well, yeah, the recording date was October. <laughs> are, are, are you thinking about doing any, uh, like, how-to videos uh, with Premiere Pro? and Not and with Premiere Pro, more with uh, camping and drones. Uh, there's a lot already, uh, already a lot of videos on how-to with Premiere, uh, and I don't feel like quite have the skills yet to really make it... Uh, to show information that would be prudent. Uh, uh, like I was saying earlier on Claude's uh, live stream, shortcuts, learn the shortcuts. Uh, I, how big a video can that make? So I'm more inclined to like, um, my next video I was thinking of doing when I go camping is, is showers. I have the, the solar showers. Uh, I have uh, a battery operated shower that I found for 10 more dollars than a, than a solar shower. It's got a built in uh, battery power that charges via USB with a three foot hose and a shower wand. No so way. I bring an aluminum, uh, I think it's a three or four gallon aluminum pot that I put on my commercial size camping stove, heat the water to the right temperature, and then I have a shower tent. So those kinds of things, yeah, uh, I would like to do more videos on that to, okay, well, what is a better fit for you? If you're backpacking, you probably want the solar shower. But right. if you're not backpacking, you might want to spend the extra 10 bucks and have the... Uh, have the battery powered shower um, or different fire starting techniques, whether it's a piston, fire piston, uh, flint and steel, all those kinds of things. Um, I, that's that's going to be more my how to's um, in, in the coming future. Cool. Yeah, definitely. I, had, I can't wait. I had a good time doing the, uh, the generator video and the cooler video. Uh, yeah. And the cooler was a game changer for me. So I want to, you know, inspire others and give them food for thought to, uh, you know, maybe a, a Walmart cooler is perfect for them uh, because of the size. They're only going for the weekend. Those are great. Not a problem at all. Uh, but then some people are going to want to go further and longer. And so maybe a Yeti. But for a little bit more than a Yeti, you can get a 12 volt fridge. Mine's mm. a 65 quart, which is the same size as my Yeti. Uh, and they retail for only a $75 difference. Mm. Um and it also, the electric fridge comes with a 120 volt plug. So I can plug it in like uh, during uh, the evacuations uh, this last summer, we lost power for several days. Uh, I plugged it into the generator. Oh, so wow. I was able to run it off 120 volts. Um, but in the back of the pickup, I'm also privileged enough to have a seven pin connector. On Amazon, I found a seven pin to dual cigarette charge port, basically, um, connector. So from that, I can run the fridge 
and then I can also run, uh, I have a battery, uh, a Kubota, I think, or Minn Kota, uh, battery box for my 85 amp hour deep cycle battery. So while I'm driving around, I'm charging the deep cycle battery and running the fridge. But as soon as I park, I pull the connector out of the truck and the fridge is running off the battery. Uh, I've run the fridge off the battery for two and a half days and I was still above 12 volts. Oh, wow that's phenomenal <laughs> again i didn't have to buy any ice i didn't have to drain any water i didn't have to anything um i'm actually toying with the idea of getting a second one at maybe like 20 20 quarts uh so that i can actually have a freezer i would love to bring ice cream <laughs> God, it's glamping i know but it would be nice to have some ice cream out in the middle of nowhere i was watching the video that you put out on that and i was actually kind of thinking about uh installing one in the trailer yeah they're extremely efficient they're actually uh right. the one we have is uh, not as efficient as they get. I have a friend that spent the same amount of money, but got one that's uh, half the size, um, but it's, uh, it uses half the amount of power. Right. It's, I think it's like 25 watts. It's next to nothing. Whereas ours is like 70 watts. So, um, you know, there, there is uh, knockoff brands that are going to use la more power than mine, but be even cheaper. Uh, I forget the brand name of mine. And then there's mine that's kind of in the middle. And then there's like a super top of the line that uses almost no power. So if you figure you're using uh, even mine at 70 watts, that's not even a very big solar panel. Hmm. So if you got, say, a 100 watt solar panel or 140 watts, run that during the day. You almost don't even need to hook up your truck at all. You could just leave the cooler in camp. Uh, and it's got heavier duty latches than the Yeti does. A bear is going to have a, it's got to chew through the metal, not the hardened plastic to get in there. Uh, granted, it's going to roll it around and kind of mess up your food. But he's not going to get in there and you can always strap it to a tree. So at some point I will be getting a solar panel and an inverter to, so that I don't have to carry the cooler with me everywhere I go or, oh, the battery's getting low. I better throw it in the truck and go for a drive for a while, which isn't the end of the world with the seven pin connector in the charge port, but Still, I like the convenience, and I can always put panels on the roof of the uh, trailer, too. Right. Yeah, with our toy hauler and these trips that we go on, um, you know, we, we can be out there for almost two weeks. And uh, the, the little fridges that you get in the toy haulers or the, the little refrigerators that run off propane or, or, mm -hmm. uh, or a 12 volt. Mm -hmm. oh, I guess it's not 12 volt. It'd be the. Uh... Anyways, um, it doesn't give you a whole lot of room. Uh, we have an outside kitchen that's got a mini fridge in it, but yet you got to keep, you know, run your generator to okay. to, run it, to keep it cool. Yeah, so you don't want to run it all day. I don't want the generator running all day long. No. So I was thinking about pulling that outside fridge mm -hmm. and then putting uh, one of those um, chest uh, refrigerators that you got mm -hmm. in there. And I think that'd be way more efficient and uh, be able to, hold a lot more food for these long trips that we go on yeah they go i forget what size but they go up to i think 100 quarts it's super oh, pretty wow. big yeah they make bigger ones than i have uh and having the in the light inside is really pretty cool so at night you don't need to have a headlamp or a flashlight while you're digging through your cooler right. um just click on the light and all of a sudden the whole cooler lights up inside and you can dig through real easily um so and they were readily available on amazon i haven't checked any other websites but uh i i, I i'm never going back it because they're so portable and even in a car or a minivan plug it they've all nowadays they've all got the charge ports in the back right. plug it in and again you don't have to worry about ice you don't have to worry my biggest thing was always food contamination with the water i right. just I was, you pull your butter out and it's dripping like Granted, yeah, it's cooler water, so it's not that bad, but it's still like, oh, ew. Right. <laughs> I don't want to be feeding that to the bears because that's what it meant for me. But right. uh, that is that was the biggest selling point for me after going through. We took it through. Actually, this so this cooler uh, I mentioned in the video, we took it through Death Valley. It was 117 degrees outside in the bed of a black truck. And the bed is coated in black uh, uh, rhino lining. The cooler kept our food frozen. Wow. And actually for we we didn't notice but the button had gotten pushed and lowered the temperature and when we went to pull out a gatorade and some we had some uh, fresh fruit in there it was a slushy <laughs> 117 degrees outside and it was a slushy wow yeah I, I didn't think that was possible i mean hmm. when you're yeti it's gonna get warm there's no right. no two ones about it so having the having that oh yeah I, i'm sold <laughs> i'm sold hey, so hey, what, what's the price point on those uh, I think I paid four ninety nine for the sixty five quart. Okay. Um, I think it was right under five hundred bucks. And again, they have cheaper versions. 
and they right. have more expensive versions. They get uh, what you pay for, though. You do. Again, the higher you go, the more efficient it's going to be. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So you're going to use less power. But again, if you're like me, where I'm going on daily trips when I'm up there, I'm dropping the trailer and going for a drive. I just leave it in the truck. So I don't really have to have the super expensive one that's going to uh, use next to no power. Um, and again, at some point, I'm going to have the panels. It's just a matter of time because uh, I don't go through any hardcore trails at this point. Uh, I use other people's vehicles when we get up there. Hey, you want to come with me? You've got the nice TRD. Let's go. <laughs> I'll cook you dinner. <laughs> Have you, ever, have you ever looked into those uh, wind generators at all? Hmm. Uh, I have a little experience doing those with uh, off-grid living. Uh, I'd love to get one. I don't know enough about them to know their size, weight to uh, output. Mm -hmm. um, I know that like the spot uh, Simpson Camp, um, which I know you were, are aware of that. I've got a few flights through down in there. Um, it, that's kind of like a wind tunnel. So in that sense, right. it'd be a great place to maybe have one because it's almost always got a breeze or wind going. Um, but again, I don't know the weight and size to output power yet. Gotcha. But that is a good point. Something to think about. And, uh, you know, I was kind of thinking about that for us too, um, you know, mounting one on the trailer at times. Mm -hmm. But I, I was always wondering what the wind noise through that would sound like. And if it would be annoying for for the other campers or the folks you're camping with, yeah, I don't know, but I imagine that's also going to be like the you know the the more you pay, the quieter it's going to be because uh, I've done um, like gable vents for houses. Uh, you go buy one at Home Depot and it shakes the wall and you can hear it throughout the entire house. Um, mm -hmm. But I had a client that money wasn't the object, so he made me he paid me to shop around. Uh, we found one from Germany that had balanced blades. I mean, this hmm. thing spins fast and moves a ton of air. And when you stood on the wall below the gable end, you couldn't hear it at all. No. So I would imagine, and I'm only guessing here, that um, something similar is going to be with the wind turbines. And they've been out for long enough that you probably could find something that's going to be quiet. Um, and I would think the most important thing to do would be to have some sort of tripod or some sort of pole you can put in the ground. Extendable. So it's not mounted to your, your, your trailer. Because right. then you get the reverberation down the pole and then connected to your trailer. Uh, and that would be what I'd guess would be the most amount of noise. Um, now, granted, in the sand, your bearings might wear out and you hear that. Right. But even that, you know, uh, it's going to be quite a while with today's technology. Mm -hmm. And then they have ones that now they, uh, the little fin in the back will turn out of the way when the wind gets too high. So it doesn't right. overspeed the unit. Um right. There are also, I've heard of guys uh, taking alternators and taking out the insides and re-gearing them because yeah. an alternator is actually meant to spin at a higher RPM, like an engine right. speed, so you don't get any current at a low speed. You, but me, I'd rather just spend the money. <laughs> yeah, and I think the technology with the uh, horizontal uh, wind generators, too, is really picking up. Mm -hmm. I'd like to see a compact, a compact version of one of those. Uh, super efficient. Mm -hmm. and I don't, I don't think the wind noise would would be a problem with those now don't forget you're going to need to factor in a charge controller of some kind something that's going to take that incoming power right. and convert it to battery like 12 volts or whatever voltage your battery bank is um you can change the voltage on the battery banks you know 50 60 volts and then that will make it so that you're not uh drawing as much amps to bring it up to 120 volts because mm -hmm. if you've got a 12 volt system and you're bringing it up to 100 and uh uh, 120 volts you're going to be pulling a lot of amps mm -hmm. so your amp hour you are gonna need a whole lot of amp hours whereas if you got several batteries wired them in series series parallel you can bring your voltage up to say uh 50 or 60 you're going to be pulling almost half the number of amps to create the 120 volts if that right. makes any convoluted sense right um so that would be the the concern but i know outback makes some amazing systems that are uh salt water resistant sand resistant and they're almost plug and play uh, you just get the batteries and wire everything together, and it was really simple to do. I did the the off grid system. I did. I had to do almost no research at all, and it was like, okay, battery twelve volt, battery negative. Okay, uh, photovoltaic positive, photovoltaic negative, um, and then we even hooked up a generator with a self start. So I programmed in, okay, if the battery gets to this level, start yeah. the generator, and the generator then goes through the infra, uh, and uh, not the power inverter. Uh, yeah, the power inverter and goes back into the batteries and charges them that way. And that was really simple to do. But again, uh, with panel, solar panel, photovoltaic, or with um, uh, wind, 
you're or hydro, you're going to have to have a charge controller of some kind. Uh, but there, the, as technology goes, it gets cheaper and cheaper and cheaper and cheaper. Right. Well, uh, step, I gotta step away for a minute. I gotta get a drink. Yeah, All no right. worries. Be right back. All right. And I've got my son hounding me in the background. Yes, Oliver. Huh? Yes, Oliver. Uh, I was wondering about his computer for like an hour. Uh, half an hour. If so, where is it? Uh, I don't know. Good luck. All right, whatever. Uh. So back to talking about camping. Uh, the next place I am hoping to go again is the M1 up towards Indian Dick. Uh, it's one of my favorite places to visit. Uh, but I am concerned that uh, that entire area is going to be covered in snow. Uh, and if it isn't covered in snow, is there going to be ice? Because, um, again, I don't have anything that's well built, um, uh, but I do have traction control. So we're going to see where we can go, what we can do, and what we can find out there. But I, I, being out in the woods, it doesn't matter uh, what we find or how far we can get. It's just being out in the woods and recharging our batteries, if you will. That's the main thing that matters and I just want to get away. So next weekend, we'll see what we can do. And hopefully I'll be able to record enough stuff and get a video launched so that other people can get a, an idea of what that area is like this time of year. Um, and granted, every year is different. The amount of snowfall is different, but um, get out and explore. There's so much area out there that you don't need to stay in a campground if that's not your style. Just get out and uh, you can, like I was showing earlier, this map here, the Mendocino National Forest, pretty much all of it is open to dispersed camping. So basically you just can't stay right next to a campground, um, but you can stay pretty much anywhere else. If you drive up and there's a fire ring, um, there's some sort of road where you're not driving over the grass and over a bunch of logs. Uh, if it looks like other people have stayed there, you can stay there uh, and stay for up to 14 days, I believe it is, and then you move somewhere else. Um, we found some spots up, I, I keep saying Plaskett Meadows area because I just, I, every time I go, I find something new and beautiful. Um, we found spring water up there. So I've been up there before and uh, I found spring water, uh, harvested fish right from the lake and then been uh, to a mountaintop and enjoyed the sunset. Um, and uh, to me, that that's camping. That is awesome camping right there. I do have a hunting license. I do hunt, but Right now, I just, uh, fishing is more my style. I want to kick back and relax and uh, tight lines, as the saying goes. So, yeah, that's that's my thing. And uh, I've promised myself, I used to go all the time. Um, I used to go all the time to Whole Mountain. Uh, every time. I don't know why. For many years, we'd go to the exact same spot, exact same spot, exact same spot. And then it was finally, uh, I was pushed to go, hey, let's go check this area out. And uh, like, oh, this is beautiful. And then I finally got vehicles that are reliable. I used to drive an 87 Toyota pickup that was a nice truck. It was very capable of getting around. And if it got scratched or dented or dinged, I never cared. Um, but I never really trusted it. So now with these vehicles that all have warranties and better traction control, I'm finding myself getting out there and just going uh, and just for a day trip. Um, there's so much area you can get to in uh say two three four hours and be home by dark or well not this time of year um but you can be home after dark and explore a new area every single time um there's a lot of area that's not under uh covered in snow right now that is uh, uh amazing to visit um and if it is covered in snow just put a little circle on it come back to it um i've got circles all over my maps <laughs> uh i'm i'm constantly finding new areas uh and I, I have finally learned that I am, I'm like I said, I'm a hunter. I do like to target shoot also, but I've learned that uh, sometimes leaving them at home, uh, the weapons at home and going out into the game refuge, there's some beautiful stuff in there and there's no one there. So you really get true peace and serenity and are really able to recharge your batteries without any issues of, uh, oh, it's so-and-so, uh, or uh, oh, what are they doing here? Or, uh oh, uh, are they pulling in? Mm -mm. Uh, back in those areas, you're not going to find anybody. Uh, even like I was saying when I was there in August, that's the middle of summer, almost peak camping season. Mm -mm, I saw one car uh, and they were actually headed to that swimming hole I was talking about. And we went there with my son and uh, the, the, the water was clear. It was warm and it was really wide and really deep. So uh, I don't have the actual location off the top of my head, but uh, it, it's on a big turn. You look down and there's a huge swimming area. 
uh, kind of a steep hill, but again, it's all sand. So it was not dangerous to climb down. It was kind of fun actually to go down. I wish I had a piece of cardboard almost. Um, so uh, get out and explore. Don't, don't, don't be held back. Uh, I've seen uh, headed out FH7. I've seen a Prius driving around out there. There's lots of roads that you don't have to have anything special to get around on. Um, again, uh, my Subaru is stock. Granted, it has nine inches of ground clearance, but I've made it down a ton of different trails. I've seen Toyota Corollas Corol getting around out there on the major roads. Um, just be aware that you don't want to go, you know, rally racing out there because there'll be that surprise pothole or rut or divot or what have you. As long as you're slow, one of my uh, common sayings I say a lot is it's 60% driver and 40% vehicle. So as long as you're a good driver, you can get a minivan into a lot of the places that I go to. A lot of these videos you see, I could get a minivan into without any issue, without popping tires, without bottoming out, not an issue at all. So uh, don't, don't hesitate. Go explore and have fun. Um, get out there and see things that nobody else is seeing and enjoy them. Uh, and again, the more we use them, the, the more likely it is that they're going to stay available to us and maintenance might be put into them, um, especially some of the campgrounds where money is taken in. That money can be used. Uh, last, let's, let's see, two or three, basically the beginning of, end of spring, beginning of summer, we ran into a group of people at Plesket Meadows, and I didn't know it, but they had actually pushed for grant funding and spent a ton of money on that area for publicity and cleaning it up to try and get people to come out to these areas. And I said, oh, well, uh, I love. so it inspired me to start making videos and publishing videos to get people to go out there. Um, and actually one of my better videos is Plesket Meadows, uh, a beautiful place to camp. It gets in, it's getting a lot of views. Um, and it is truly an amazing area, but around it, again, you can disperse camp all over those end roads. There's plenty of places to go to um, all over. And I believe FH7 goes all the way over to the five, if I'm correct. So basically 101 to the five is almost, well, except for once you get past Covalo, it's all dirt and you can just stay, uh, well, not anywhere, but anywhere that's an established spot. It's called dispersed camping. And I there's a link on Mendocino National Forest. If you type in dispersed camping, all the guidelines are on there about how far you have to stay from a campground, um, uh, clean up after yourself and all that kind of stuff. And then watch the Cal Fire video that's on that same page so that you're compliant when you have a video and you're not that guy that's starting the forest on fire. Because we don't want to ruin it for everybody, but it's 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 not a common sense is not a great term to use because everybody thinks differently. But it's not that hard to figure out. Uh, and by all means, if anybody that's watching has any questions or comments, reach out. I'll do my best to find the solution, find the answer. If I don't know it, I'm a firm believer. It's not what you know, it's who you know. I'll reach out to who I know. I'll even call the ranger station and ask some questions. Because if I don't know, I want to know. Because I want to make sure I'm compliant. Um, I want to make sure I'm following the rules. I don't want to abuse things and I don't want to be that guy. I want the good press, not the bad press. Um, one of the things I heard well, once before that was uh, uh, surprised me is that if you are that guy that lights the fire and they do launch one of the tankers, they have to drop their load. Guess who's on the uh, going to pay for that bill? Whoever started the fire. That's a hell of a lot of money for an accident that you just didn't need to have happen. So uh, be compliant. Again, the, the 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 website is extremely easy to follow, uh, very easy to search. Uh, again, the, the easiest way I found was I went to the site map. And then from there, uh, you can find uh, harvest permits. So like camping or uh, uh, Christmas trees. This year, we filled out a Christmas tree permit back in October. It was $10.00. I mailed it into the uh, Covalo office, I think it was. Uh, and then early November, I got a little uh, manila envelope in the mail with my permit and all the regulations on what to follow. Um, it ended up, we took our car out there. We ended up spending, I think it was $45 in fuel and the permit. Now across the street, they were selling Christmas trees that were about three and a half, four, five feet tall. They were charging $100 per tree. So I got to spend the day in the woods with my family and come back with a very nice tree for half as much money. Yeah. So you can get a harvest permit. Uh, there's a bunch of stuff up in there. Uh, the uh, campfire permits, uh, road regulations, they're all readily available. They make it very easy for us to find. And again, if you like to fly drones, you're allowed to fly drones up in there. Just don't crash and pop your lipo. <laughs> and Dylan, if you're close to one of these ranger stations, and I, we do this here when, when we, our family goes up and gets a tree, is uh, say the, the, sometime the, the, the week leading to the weekend that we're going, 
we'll just stop in the ranger station just buy the permit then and there which permits that the craft uh, christmas, christmas, permit? christmas tree permit yep okay guys i know there's a deadline on which you have to file by i forget what it is I think it's december 10th or something uh, me actually the nearest one is covalo and that's uh hour and a half depending on what car i'm driving so it's not that easy it was just much easier to put a stamp on the letter and send out a ten dollar check um but they were very prompt and uh i was actually shocked at uh how easy it was to follow the regulations they make the map very easy to follow they tell you how you have to be a certain distance from the road the trunks has to be a certain size as a maximum height it's all real simple um we actually got real lucky though on the way back it was raining when we got back we we had we had the permit around the trunk like it says uh and several stems up so that it couldn't be removed and reused because you're not allowed to do that uh we had a little chunk that was left it happened to it was raining so hard it fell apart and that little chunk broke off and got snagged on a branch yeah. so i'm so glad i didn't get pulled over because all there was was this little like two inch by two inch square that didn't even have my name on it but uh and the rangers just to make it uh, just so people are aware when we went up to harvest the park ranger was patrolling he was up there and he was looking at tags uh there we went up to whole mountain um, because I'm familiar with that area. We wanted to go around the backside up FH7 and come up uh, M1 that way, but to me, that was a long drive. So we went up Whole Mountain, uh, and I was blown away at how many people go harvest Christmas trees. I think I counted 45 cars with Christmas oh, trees wow. on them. Uh, and some of them only had like three or foot tall trees, which I don't know the minimum size, uh, if there is one, uh, but they all had trees. They mm -hmm. all had trees. Um, so it's obviously something that people like to do. And to me, what better way to spend the day with your family? Right. You could go to this Christmas tree farm and go pick out a tree and you'll have thousands to choose from. But when you're in the woods, you've got millions to choose from. Also, you're out there with your family bonding. Uh, back in my younger years, it used to be you'd go to a Christmas tree farm and they'd give you a pole saw and you would go through and cut down your tree, put it on a dolly and go pay for it. And that was great. That was wonderful. But to me, this year, I, 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 that's the way I'm going to do it every year from now on. I bought a little handsaw, and now that I know the regulations and how easy it is to get that permit, that's how I'm getting my Christmas tree every right. year. Every uh, year. Droned up is here in the chat. He says, uh, "Tell the story about your drone going for a swim." Okay, so uh, the time I crashed with Eric around, it didn't go for a swim, but there was uh, my my first drone was an E Flight QX3. Uh, it's about at this point about 11 years old. Uh, basically, the camera's done for by now. I use it as a trainer drone for people to just have fun with. Um, I have a video up of uh, East Park Reservoir. I was up flying up there, um, and this was back in the days before you really had good strong signal. Um, return to home was kind of crappy, and it certainly didn't tell you any telemetry at all. Your signal strength, your battery life. Um, it had blinking LEDs, but you had to memorize like 15 different patterns of LEDs to understand what it's telling you. Um, so I'm out flying around and cruising and having a great time. And then all of a sudden, uh, so with this drone, when it ran into power, it just starts going down. Now you uh -huh. can go left and right, but you can't go back up. And I was about 30 feet from the shore when it started to go down, but I was only about four feet off the water. <laughs> so you can guess what happened. I basically, I gave it full back and prayed. And sure enough, nope, it hit the water and it went down. So immediately I set the transmitter down. I took out my wallet, my phone, set them on the ground, and I swam out to get it. And I couldn't see. It. Oh, there we go. Um, uh, I swam out real quick. And fortunately, I don't know how, the lights were still blinking. And I was able to use that as a, as a beacon to swim down and recovered it. Oh, no way. Yeah, I recovered it. Uh, fortunately, it was a next to no humidity and 120,000 degrees outside. And I just happened to have a box fan and some power. So I let it sit there for a long time. But after that, the camera never really worked right. And unfortunately the card got corrupted because it got wet. Um, but uh, yeah, that, that's my drone going for a swim. Uh, so that's two crashes I do have under my belt. Um, and unfortunately I don't have the footage to prove it. Cause that would be a lot of fun to see the, you know, 
sinking through the water and then falling into the leaves or the weeds and all the crap at the bottom would have been a lot of fun to have. But um, that's my story of it going for a swim. Uh, the time with when I was out with Eric, though, it didn't fall in the water. It, uh, it was like 10 feet from the water and it just slammed to the pole and fell. Uh, it hit a cement block, tumbled a couple times. And uh, it was, I have the picture somewhere. It was destroyed because, again, it hit gimbal first. Oh, wow. <laughs> it was done. Um, but yeah, that QX3 actually still flies. Uh, the camera doesn't work, but it still flies. Uh, the last time we went out camping, we actually tethered, uh, took a long piece of string and a wiffle ball, and we were towing it in front of the shooters like clay, like a clay. But a <laughs> wiffle ball flying at 20 miles an hour, it's a that's a hard shot to make. So that's basically what I do with it now. It's a trainer drone, and I take high risk stuff that uh, you know, <clears throat> high risk with it. it doesn't have the camera, but high risk is just fun to do um haul a target with it you know mm -hmm. not explosive targets because that you get in a lot of trouble for right. explosive targets i think it's twenty five thousand dollars and three years in jail uh if you attach a firearm also so that's a no-no but there's nothing wrong with tethering a wiffle ball to it that's you know your your weapons on the ground behind the drone but it always gets a smile out of people because it's something unique that not others can do so mm -hmm. um yeah that that's kind of my <laughs> my little joking story about the drones <laughs> well, we got uh, four people watching so if you got any other questions for uh dylan here uh, get in the live chat and and type away yeah uh, please, please do at least get uh, in there and say hi and uh, that you're supporting his channel yeah i do thank for everybody for the support and i i i i love camping so much and i just love seeing people get out there and i uh it's always so much fun the last time i went out during deer season there were several people out there but everyone was friendly we ended up pulling that guy out of the ditch and next thing i know we're chilling having dinner with him hmm. <laughs> like yeah. i've never seen the guy before in my life ever and we're having dinner together yeah. um the for the most part people out in the woods they're they're a different kind of people uh i don't like going into san francisco for one i feel like i gotta burn my shoes when i leave but also everybody's looking at the ground and if you say hi they think you're some sort of creep weirdo that's gonna like steal from them or something it doesn't happen out in the yeah. woods uh, everybody's hey, friendly and having a good time. Hey, Dylan. Yeah. Who's your favorite brother? Because both of them are watching. Oh, no. Oh. <laughs> I played the fifth. <laughs> <laughs> the one oh, who oh, stays oh. on the longest. Yeah, there you go. The, uh, yeah, the, yeah, I, I got to admit, the one that we get out and ride is a lot of fun. He's also got a lot of fun toys, but uh, they're all fun to go out with in their own unique ways. Uh, um, I wish I could get my older brothers to come out with me, but unfortunately one lives down in Santiago, Chile. So that's not happening. Yeah. Uh, the other one lives down in Pacifica and he is having some kind of medical stuff going on. So I don't see that happening. Uh, but the one down in uh, Santa Cruz, if you're watching Keith, hint, hint, you've asked me to go like five times and let you know every time I'm going, let's go. <laughs> I'll drive. If you want to bring the wife and kids, I'll bring up the red carpet too. Well, actually, the green, more like AstroTurf, but you get my point. <laughs> Greg's his favorite. <laughs> yeah, right. That's yeah, sure. Uh, <laughs> um, yeah, no, it's a it, it's a fun passion to do, and again, it makes me always come back so much more refreshed than uh, going into the city and having to deal with all the traffic and the parking and. Um, <laughs> uh, dealing with all the traffic and whatnot is just no fun for me anymore. I want to get out there and play. And um, I actually, to be honest, when I go out now, a lot of the times I find myself just exploring, but also just filming. So when I go out with these other people and I go on the rides, uh, I get a little bit of heat because I'm setting up cameras. <laughs> like, hey, God, God, we're waiting for him. He's putting another camera on. Oh, he's changing battery. Oh, he's changing camera angles. Well, yeah, that's me, pretty much. But when we come back and I make a video, I never hear any complaints. <laughs> it's a lot of fun. And again, I, I, the, the anamorphic lens is going to be my next goal to get that out there and see what that can do. Because that ultra widescreen, oh, juicy. Yes, please. Nice. So, yeah, we, we definitely have to get you on our live show here one of these days when, when we get started back up. Um, Good. Well, I'm, I'm all about being on uh, sharing information, uh, whether it be about drones, flying, action cameras, editing, uh, camping, exploring, recovery, <laughs> any of the above. Yeah. Excuse me. I am uh, all about it.
Um, our, our channel, it started out more of a, a family channel, kind of document, documenting the trips that we, we go on. But I found that uh, going on these trips, I was finding the most interesting people out there and the most kind-hearted people. Mm -hmm. I think that's kind of where we're taking the channel now is, is not only our family, but the people that we meet. Mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, we're, we're really trying to inspire people to, to shut the TV off, shut off the video games, and just get out there and have an adventure. You know, mm -hmm. say, say like you do when you go camping. If no one's ever gone camping before, go to your closest KOA. You know, you can get, if you don't have a trailer, you can rent a cabin and, and camp mm -hmm. out there and then slowly work yourself up into mm -hmm. the dispersed camping. You know, mm -hmm. do a KOA. Do that a couple of times where you feel comfortable and then maybe go to a campground that has a little bit more people in it. So, you know, if, if you got questions or you feel like you're getting in trouble, you've got that surrounding public. Um, once you feel comfortable with that, then start getting more and more remote. And uh, yeah, you'll, you'll absolutely love it. Um, but yeah, we're, we're trying to bring on inspiring type people on the show. And, and we really want you on there, Dylan, to, to inspire I would love to come on to get out there and camp and, and tell us uh, your story. Yeah. And uh, Brennan, this is Brian. I was talking about going up with the, the sand rails uh, and I think it would be, or the Can-Am. I think it would be great to do a trip with him. Granted, it's a long drive. I think I'm after it. it's like 10, 12 hours for me, but I would like to try and do that before it's time to, to go to the East coast. Uh, it'd be a lot of fun. Um, but to further your other point about going out camping, there's a, there's state parks uh, that have cabins. They're, yeah. they're, they have a bed and a little fireplace yeah. um, that you don't have to go to the KOA. There's plenty of options. If you're looking for something to, to, to get out and uh, start off new or start, uh, start off with something you're unfamiliar with, there's lots of ways to start. And you can reach out to me if you want, and I'll give you some suggestions of places to go. Um, but yeah, that's a good point about actually interviewing people that you're meeting out there. I've never thought about that. I always find that people are camera shy, but they might not all be so camera shy. Maybe I should have to ask them because he you knows know, what I'm meeting. With the, the last video I just did of those sand rail guys, mm -hmm. uh, of course, I, I introduced myself and I asked him if I could film it. And then when, once I was done, well, I guess while I was filming, I had a couple of the guys come up and they were really interested in the drone, showed them what I was doing, the controls. You know, I took it up high where they can look in the screen. They thought it was super cool. And then I told them I'd put a, if I got enough footage, I'll, I'll make a separate video for them. Mm -hmm. And they, they thought that that was the most amazing thing. And then once I did uh, get the video out there, not only them, but people in their group came back and thanked me for, for what I did. And I was like, ah, I was just doing it for fun, you know, <laughs> yeah. an experience. I enjoyed doing it, but the, I think that also gives a positive light to the drone pilots. Uh, when you're doing something like that for people free of charge, um, something that they could show their family what they're doing. Uh, I, I thought, yeah, like the, the when I was showing or the video I was showing earlier, the guy on the quad on two wheels, he was floored that I made mm -hmm. him a little 30 second clip and I put his name in there right. so that he could put it up on Instagram. Yeah. But it took me just a few minutes. It probably took me longer to record it than it did to actually make the cut because he's not looking for anything fancy with whatnot. I just put a few transitions in there and glitches and called it yeah. done. And then I snuck my name in at the end. <laughs> yeah, it's super cool footage for you to, to take and, and process too. Mm -hmm. so, Absolutely. So Bay Area Supermoto, this is your brother? Mm -hmm. Is it? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Uh, so you say Coos Bay? <laughs> Yeah, so I think where he's saying he went to uh, Oregon. Yeah, we're going to Coos Bay this year. Oh, okay. So well, maybe that's the one I should have. Uh, I think that's a little closer for me. I'm not sure, but yeah, Winchester Bay is actually just north, and uh, we're going there as well. But it's not too far north of Coos Bay. Your can am sure gets a lot of exercise. It needs it. It <laughs> wants it. Yeah. Well, for the price you probably paid for it, I would too. You know, people always complain about the price, but um, you look at it as having a rig set up for Baja, which most mm -hmm. of those rigs cost at least a half a million dollars to build. Mm -hmm. And you're getting it for, well, I bought mine for 24K. Mm -hmm. that's, that's 
That's quite a bit. Of, yeah. It's a lot less, although it's a little more than I paid for my WR250. <laughs> a small Baja rig. I mean, when the guys go out and race Baja in the big trophy trucks, do you know what they, uh, what do you call it before you go out and you check the course out, a pre-ride or? Um, I know what you mean. I'm not sure the phrase, but I know what you mean. But they use the UTVs to do that in. Okay. Because it's one, they can get through it faster. It's more comfortable. And they're not beating up their, their big expensive trucks. And they're like, the why the truck? hell didn't we buy these in the first place and go and go in the UTV class? It would be so much cheaper to do. <laughs> yeah, but something about the bragging rights having a trophy truck, right? Oh, man. <laughs> That's a whole new beast. Yeah. <laughs> oh, no, uh, unimportant wants to see some uh, oh drone crashes. <laughs> yeah, a popular thing i guess i gotta go find some cheap drones and go crash them oh geez <laughs> i was uh looking up the uh, mavic mini to see if there were any open box or slightly used but mm -mm, they're all about this 500 dollars range there's nothing cheap out there because i do want to like the uh you know i have the a uh, hero 4 that i'll put basically anywhere i don't care if it breaks i can get another one for 65 bucks on ebay um I'm looking for something like that with a drone. Uh, so I'm not sure what I'm going to get. Uh, the mini would be really sweet, but I'm going to look into more of the DJI products because I want one that I can take some high risk shots with and, you know, fly faster through the trees. And if it breaks, oh, that sucks, but it's not my Mavic 2 Pro at 1800 bucks. Um, so that's going to be my next thing is looking around to see what I can find that I can not worry about. You want to see a drone crash? You got one? Yeah. Give me a sec. I'll see if I, can, I can't find it here real quick. It's going to take me a little bit. All right. Well, we keep talking. The uh, <coughs> Again, if anybody has any questions about where to start off or questions about gear or whatnot, please, we're all ears uh, or eyes when it comes to the chat. Uh, please uh, give us some inspiration of things to talk about, and let's see if we can help get you out there and uh, maybe open up your world to uh, something different that you've never tried before. Uh, or a new area you've never seen before or uh, an area that you'd love to show somebody else and take somebody else to you'd be inspired to get other people to go out and see. It is horrid. <laughs> He's looking frantically. I can see the oh, I'm looking. glowing in his eyes. <laughs> my, my screen is so damn big. Uh, drone, yeah, I can see your eyes moving all over the place. Oh, yeah. Steve. Look at drone compilation, drone crash compilation 2019. <laughs> I used to uh, fly. I used to do a lot of gaming in my earlier years. And I used to particular like uh, Aces High, which was a World War II aircraft simulator. Mm -hmm. um, and generally the bigger screen, the better you can see stuff. So I think this is a 32 inch computer screen. Well, it's a TV that I hooked up to the computer. So. So I, I got to exercise before I uh, get on and do anything because you kind of work the neck muscles. <laughs> hawk swoop of the Phantom 2. I've had uh, a number. You know, so you just commented about a hawk swoop. I've come back and actually noticed on some of my videos how close some of the vultures and red tails have come to my aircraft uh, without me like knowing they were even there. They just swoop in out of nowhere. And it's kind of scary when you got eighteen hundred dollars flying up in the air, and this giant bird with a four foot wingspan swoops in in front of your camera. Um, I was out, uh, I think, three weeks ago, flying off uh, Highway One Twenty Eight, uh, trying to get some really awesome sun flares and some reflections off the water in the Great Vineyards. Uh, and next thing I know, a vulture is like right alongside me. <laughs> like, oh no, I'm getting out of here. All it takes is them to swoop over, and you're you're on the ground. <laughs> I found it. Well, how do I share that? Uh, I have to share it. You can go full screen. Um, full screen on me. I think you hit screen share and then I hit full screen, right? Yeah, you can just full. You should be able to full screen me now. And then I should be able to share. Oh, that's me. How do I switch over to you? Not quite sure how I switch over to you. Um, yeah, I don't know either. <laughs> my first, my first live stream, and I got all kinds of bugs going on. Here. Um, um, can you right click on my screen? Does it do? Oh, anything? here we go. Solo layout. How about <clears throat> there we go. 
Okay, let me see if I can do it on my end here. Okay. The oh. most legal places to fly over, uh, BLM is extremely forgiving, but again, also uh, the national forest, not national parks. Let's make that clear. Um, I go to the national forest and I fly everywhere, absolutely everywhere and have a great time doing it. Uh, BLM, again, is also completely legal. I've flown down in Utah. There's a bunch of BLM, no issues at all. BLM here in California, no issues at all. Nevada, no issues at all. So if you're looking for fun places to fly where there's few restrictions, the only restrictions you're going to have to worry about would be MOAs. Uh, military operations areas, um, but even those, you don't have to get prior authorization. You just need to be very careful about watching for other aircraft. Um, but for the most part, uh, you're going to be okay in those areas. All right, Dylan, are you seeing this at all? Yeah, full screen. Okay, so this is the shot that I wanted to reveal, right? Okay. Beautiful shot, right? You got Banshee Hill. This is supposed to be one of the, the steepest hill climbs in the on the Oregon coast and the sand dunes. And if you look on the, the left lane, that's where people come up and the right lane is where people go down. Um, people race up and down this thing all day long. So that's the kind of shot that I wanted with the coast in the back. So here I'm, I'm kind of getting, uh, I got the drone up, kind of getting set up for the shot that I want. Yeah, center so this is a, This is something you shot or filmed. Oh yeah, this is where I crashed my drone. Okay. Oh, you're able to recover the footage. I wish I could get mine. So I'm backing up. Okay, yeah, that's the reveal shot I want. So I'm going to come forward a little bit and up, but I use the wrong inputs and I do more forward than up. And you'll. I you'll still see it. just you though. You got to share your screen. Oh, you do? Yeah, I see you. Oh, I shared it. Uh, I see you in your uh, green screen background. Oh. Okay. Um, that you have the full screen. Yeah, yeah. Uh, let me let me work here. Application window. But while you're doing that, uh, against the law, the most illegal places to fly are national parks. They will take your equipment oh, without yeah. question. Don't fly in them. Well, don't take off or land from them. Oh, here we go. Okay, it's asking me to. Okay, can you see it now? I can see you now. Now, can you see the, the video? Yeah, I see the video. Okay. So I'll push play. Let me know if it's running. Yep. Okay. I see the scroll bar going. So here we're just trying to center up the shot. Backing up. That's going to be my reveal shot. That's your Can-Am? No, that's the Polaris that I owned before the Can-Am. Okay. That's the 900 Trail. All right. So that's... Kind of the reveal I want, you know. Yeah. I, I need to go up and forward, but I put a little too much forward, and it it bites the sand. Here we go, boom! Oh, you didn't make it very far. <laughs> no. Yeah, and the gimbal's all screwed up. It was flying, and that's where the leg folded, and it flipped. Oh man, play that again. All right, here we go. Centering up the shot. Which I could probably play that in reverse and get the shot I want, huh? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'd be walking backwards, but. So you'll see it, the gimbal gets all screwed up because it, it hit the sand, mm -hmm. but it was flying for probably two or three seconds with the, the arm halfway folded. So here it goes. Boom. Yeah. Now it's still flying. Still flying. I down leg, though? leg snaps. And then it falls. Wow. The gimbal, like the, the gimbal was stuck facing down. Okay. It almost looks like it was flying upside down there for a bit. Yeah, I think that's just the way the gimbal was oh, on camera. Man. Ouch. So we'll do it here again. So here it bites and then it raises up. So this is looking down in the sand. It's probably hovering above it, probably <coughs> one, two feet maybe. See, it's still flying. Mm -hmm. And the leg snaps, and it tumbles. And that's when it tumbles. And then it falls. Upside oh. down, it fell. 
<laughs> What'd that cost you? Hundred bucks. Oh, that's not bad. No, I sent it into the repair guys and they opened it up, cleaned all the sand out, and then shipped it back. So better than a new drone. Yeah, uh, yeah, I'd say so. But uh, I, mine... I didn't. I didn't have any of the uh, the warranty, the extended warranty. Yeah, the uh, what is that? The Care Refresh. Yeah, I didn't have any of that because I'm like, hey, I was an RC pilot. I'm not going to wreck this thing. Yeah, I uh, unfortunately, when mine lapsed, we were evacuated for the Kincaid fire, so I missed the email and the chance to renew my care refresh. I was sad, <laughs> so now I don't have it. Uh, although uh, Claude was mentioning that there's a there is a company uh, or his insurance company will cover the drones, so I'm still waiting for a reply email from him. Uh, uh, who his uh, adjuster is, so that I can get a hold of them and see if they'll cover my stuff. Because um, I do have in the works a uh, general liability policy uh, in case I crash into a building or a person, and uh, I'll have a million dollar policy there, but they won't cover the drone. I was actually shocked that a lot of the places were denying me because my drone's too fast. No. Oh. It's not modified, it's stock. Right. <laughs> like, nope, it's too fast. We won't cover it. Okay. <laughs> so. Mm. They think they found a place, but then now I got to get renter's insurance to cover it for theft. But that will, uh, through this insurance company, will only cover it if it's at my house. So we'll see. Gotcha. Well, we're pushing kind of late. Uh, yeah, I have a good time. Uh, let's hope we can do it again soon from yeah. uh, your perspective and from mine. I'd love to uh, drum up some more for you and for myself and see what happens. Yeah, keep it going. I, at any one time there, I saw at least four people watching. So I hit five was the max I saw. Yeah, so I'll, I'll take it. It's something. This is a good start. My first, my uh, my cherry's been popped. And with uh, two hours of film or live streaming, you had at least probably two or three people watching on average. So you, you got some watch minutes out of it at least. Maybe a few subscribers. I hadn't checked. Yeah, I have no idea. It's been going up since I've been on Claude's channel. Uh, I uh, went up another 30-something oh, nice. in the last two days just from being on with Claude. So uh, I definitely will be on with him some more. Uh, I'd be honored to be on, on your channel also. Let's uh, chat it up and let's help each other out. And let's uh, and not just each other as in you, I, and Claude, but the rest of the world into okay. opening up their eyes and the to what's out there as far as flying with drones, uh, passing a Part 107, camping, or can am and getting out in the sand any of the above let's uh let's houses let's, too right yeah i could talk all that too i <laughs> uh, just don't have to talk about car repair that's the only one i want to talk about <laughs> but yeah well i was kind of strange earlier when he's he got me uh going on the the tiny house thing but it sounds uh, like he was getting interested in that subject for some yeah well, hopefully he wants to buy one because mine's going to be for sale here real soon <laughs> well he's got a piece of property that he goes up and, and rides and um i'm not sure if you would need something like that up there, but yeah, I don't know. I don't even know what it would cost for you ship to take it up there. I have no idea, but we'll find somebody. There's somebody around here who's going to want a guest quarters or a nanny unit or what have you. And I'm not worried about it. I just don't want to haul it all the way to the East coast and I could use the money to pay off a few debts anyway. So gotcha. With that said, Brian, thank you for your yes. time. Let's do this again. Uh, text me and let me know. I have the next week off, uh, and I'm very flexible even after that. So if you want me to jump on your channel, I'd be honored. Cool. Yeah, I think we're probably going to start the live streams up maybe after King of the Hammers on February. So um, well, the first two that we did, we tried to keep it structured and professional, but I felt like it was a lot more tense where mm -hmm. I think uh, the next show's – the subjects are going to be on the guests still, but mm -hmm. keep it more of like a BS type session and everybody joking around, having a good time, drinking beer, whatever. Um, so it, it's it's going to be good, I think. Well, let me know. I'll uh, be glad to be a part of it. Let's uh, share everything with the world, whether it's crashes or uh, just fun and games. Who knows? Yeah. And uh, if you want to do another one tomorrow, excuse me, <clears throat> um, we can do that. Uh, try a different time zone because it is quite late for yeah. the nation right now. Uh, <laughs> I, I found uh, like around one or two o'clock is generally a good time. Great. Well, I'll hit you up around lunchtime. Let's see what's going on. Let's okay. see if we can, we can educate the world. So cool, thank man. you, Brian. Thank you for everybody else for tuning in and uh, let's see where things go. Cuckoo. All right. Cheers, Brian. Yep. Cheers. <laughs>